So I will, let's, I'm going to start in next September. There's a gentleman by the name of Ray Rondo, who is president of an AEI chapter back in New England. And he is doing some work with AEI headquarters and will be putting on a workshop in our normal events that relate to this work he is doing for uh, the AEI headquarters, which I think is what he's trying to do is develop some kind of a strategy that they will then go off and try and market. But he's going to tell us how that will work. And so I'm kind of looking forward to it because we've had other board members in the past go to some of his talks and apparently he's very good. So that's one of the things we've uh, nailed down. We know in September he will be talking to us about something he's currently working on on behalf of the AEI headquarters. And he's going to be going, to, going around the country to various chapters and talking about it and my guess is we're going to probably be one of the first ones to hear it. Um, and let's see what else. Uh, in February, we have Marvin Appel, who has uh, also been heard by one of our other, other uh, members. And he is the son of Gerald Appel, who is the person who came up with the MACD technical indicator, which helps you determine changes in momentum and that's he's done some other things too so uh and currently gerald is uh will be coming and talking and does a, a really good job of presenting let's see who else can i get some help lynn who else have we got <laughs> who, have we, who have we actually signed up well, we have Delta Investing and we have a Chinese uh, program coming in January, and we're going to talk about that during the break uh, uh, a little later. I think we're going to go ahead and start the introduction, and uh, we'll have the speaker up here in three or four minutes. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here. I, it's probably already been mentioned, but the restrooms are out front in the lobby and in the corner back here. And... Uh, 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 one of the things I thought I would do today that we haven't done too much before, but I want to remind you of the work that's done by our board members. And as you came in today, how, yes, closer, okay. As you came in today, you're, you were uh, checked in by Deborah and Holly, uh, who uh, work to uh, work and support the board and go to the board meetings. Uh, Bill is back there, and he is handling the books and the books that we'll, uh, we have a raffle at the middle where you if you have the right ticket you get to pick whichever book you want free uh, and then over here at the audio visual broadcast booth we have Celia and, and Sock who handle that that's probably the most complicated activity we have in terms of putting it together and broadcasting the meetings and I do the audio system up here on the stage so which you if you come early you see me doing that Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, uh, do the introduction. Uh, Claudia Hill is one of our most popular speakers, and uh, she's been doing taxes for us every other year for I don't know how long. <laughs> it's been a while, and done a very good job, and we've had very good feedback from our, from, uh, our membership in AAII. And her topic is Tax Cut and Jobs Act One Year Down. And uh, that was an interesting question. How many of you thought the Tax Act would actually go through? Uh, sometimes it's very hard to get things through, through uh, the legislature. Anyway, uh, uh, Claudia is an enrolled agent, nationally rec recognized tax professional, and frequent lecturer on taxation to individuals and representatives before the IRS. She goes back to Washington often and comments on new ideas and I, I, I assume tells them how, how, how smart or dumb they are because <laughs> the kind of ideas that come up for tax or go everywhere. Uh, it's a pleasure to have her with us today. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, one comment, 
during the break, there'll be the drawing and Claudia will be covering her material through two sessions. And you just, you know, it's one opportunity to ask a very, very knowledgeable person your tax questions. And she may not answer them all, but she can at least point you in the direction that you can get the answer. And so let's give a warm welcome to Claudia. Thank you. I also bring you a mic. And then everybody, including those online, will hear your question. Good morning. One year after, although for you, it was probably just the filing season that you're still recovering from and saying, how did this happen to me? How many of you in April were sitting there saying, why do I owe this? And how many of you were saying, wow, I turned out better than I thought I was going to be? And that's what we're going to look at is the key thing. If you thought it, you turned out better than you thought, well, I'm going to ask you why in a little bit here. Okay. <laughs> because, but we'll, we're going to see. There were clear winners and losers in the tax uh, bill that came out last year. And the last time I was here was when that legislation was evolving. And as it evolved, I think I was presenting, well, you're going to lose most of your itemized deductions, but you're going to get a standard deduction. You're going to lose your exemptions. And what's that going to mean? Well, a lot of us thought, well, this was too aggressive. This was too radical. It's not going to happen. It did. And part of the issues that we ran into this last filing season, which may have been invisible to most individual taxpayers, was the amount of guidance that's required when a new tax bill passes. We re the tax bill becomes the law, then the interpretation of that law goes through the Treasury Department's counsel's office, and they try to issue guidance saying, here's what we think this means. Well, they're still issuing guidance saying here's what we think this means in many areas. And so that slowed things down. It made it so, from my perspective during this last filing season, my software was updated sometimes more than once a week, I mean, constantly having changes. And if, if any of us out in the field that are uh, people that think about this stuff more than others, if we noticed a glitch in the way something was being handled, we reported those glitches, and my gosh, the software changed again that week. So it was a continually evolving process. And one of the things that I've put out in front of IRS, at, at, um, I participate in, in two major conferences that are sponsored by the journal that I'm editor of. I'm editor of the Journal of Tax Practice and Procedure. And I, I put out at two of these major conferences, one at New York Law and the other one at UCLA, the fact that a return that was prepared on February 1st could have a totally different answer by April 15th because of the evolution of the interpretations of how the law changed. So it, it was a difficult year for those of us that paid attention to what was going on and how the law changed. I'm going to point out to you some of the quirky areas that uh, caused issues, and, I, and some of these are very basic, including your principal residence. And uh, we're, we're going to go through what to anticipate. We're going to talk about how the changes should af affect your thinking when it comes to tax planning and uh, what's still left and things you can take advantage of. And I'm also going to share with you one of the next major compliance initiatives that IRS is beginning to unfold because I suspect some of you are investing in this particular category and you need to know what's happening in it. So this is a year-end update and um, the new tax laws for 2019. Um, how would you describe the ability of our Congress to work and play well together right now? Okay, yeah, yeah, gridlock, nothing happened. So there's not a lot of changes in 2019. In fact, we are still waiting to see if there's going to be a technical correction of the things that didn't work out right in the 17 bill, which is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we'll be talking about. So we're still trying to absorb, absorb all of these changes and what they mean and how they're to be interpreted and, and implemented. Um, yeah, but this was the big media spiel that hit as soon as this thing passed. Today is a truly historic day for American people because Mr. Trump has put our nation's broken tax code behind us and ignited a new era of American prosperity by putting a new broken tax code in front of us that, that is going to take a long time to interpret. Okay. But it's different, and, and we'll wait and see. Well, this was the media talking points from, from Mr. Trump's campaign. Okay, so 
let's go with it step by step and see where we are. A key element of the tax change itself was really the change in the tax rates. And this really major because um, if you look at the tax rates uh, that are on this sheet, and I know with the lighting in here, it's not very easy to see them. I have them with me somewhere. Ah, okay, I wrote them down. The key part of it was starting at the 10%, which we had been at before, and moving up. The top bracket dropped from 39.6 to 37, as you see here. But what you can't tell in comparing these numbers with the prior one is that the biggest difference in terms of the level of tax rates changing took place in the 35 to 30, the 32, 35, 37 percent. In the past, the 35 percent bracket was extremely narrow. It only went from 416,000 to 418,000 being covered by that increment. Um, it's now 200,000 to 500,000 are covered with that bracket. So essentially what was happening is, is the tax rates themselves, for people whose income is over the 510, they saw their rates drop from 39.6 to the 37 because that's the top flat rate. People at the lower brackets saw some relief, but, but I don't think this was the whole story. I mean, a lot of PR went into, well, we changed the tax rates. They're much more beneficial to people in the lower brackets. Um, yeah, well, people at the high end will want to. But I'm gonna share with you that the number one thing in this valley that helped my clients feel like, wow, how come I don't owe as much, was what happened with the alternative minimum tax. So how many of you had been paying alternative minimum tax almost every year? And how many of you didn't have to pay it last year, or you didn't look, okay? So do you know why you didn't have to pay it? Because what happened with the alternative minimum tax was that the um, exemption amount went up slightly, but at the same time, the provision that had caused the exemption amount to dissipate, it, where it works backwards, where it dissolves it, was moved from a, oh, close to two or 300,000, I think it was 179,000. See how quickly you forget this stuff up to $1 million. So for my clients who have AMT this last year, it was because their income was well in excess of 1 million, and that's when it clicked in. Okay. So very few people, the people that I saw that still had AMT were because they had AMT preferences, such as the incentive stock options that we run into in the Valley here. So a major difference, because a whole lot of you were affected by that, that change. So, yep, there was the change in the tax rate schedule. That's what got a lot of, of PR. Um, but the standard deduction is what was responsible also for a major change in the law last year. That major change was the switch from people who had, in the past, had itemized their deductions to people who didn't have to itemize because the standard deduction was so high. And that, I'm sure, affected a whole lot of you in the room, too. Part of what made it so that your standard deductions were disappeared was because, because of the SALT limitation, which we'll go into more detail later. But in, in California, we pay fairly high state income taxes. If you have not purchased your home 40 years ago, but if you've purchased it in the last five to 10 years, you pay fairly high property taxes. And the combination of your property taxes, your income taxes, and your personal property taxes can be the largest single amount of taxes that you had been deducting prior to last year. But last year, that huge category was shrunk to $10,000. And with the shrinkage of that, of that category to $10,000, a lot of people did not have enough things to itemize. So the standard deduction for married filing joint return last year was, well, for this coming year, is 24400 Last year it was 24000 For people who are both over 65, that married filing jointly standard deduction for the 2019 year is $27,000. So if you think about it, a lot of people don't need to itemize anymore. So when you're not itemizing, and, and, and taxes aren't the only thing on the Schedule A for itemizing. There's medical, which is a 
horrendous expense for many people, especially if you retire early and you aren't 65 to get the uh, Medicare for those over 65 in terms of the rates that apply then. Um, there's medical, and we're going to go through these in more detail to try to, to hone in on what's still left and what, what nuances there are with them. But when you compare the standard deduction of 27000 for two people over 65, it, it's not just taxes that's on that schedule. It's mortgage interest. A lot of you may have had your home paid off if you don't have a mortgage on your home. But if you do, it's probably not one of the enormous ones. But the other thing that's on that schedule is charitable contributions. How many people are thinking, you know, if I'm not going to be able to deduct it, maybe I won't give as much. And you're not alone if you think that way. Because that had a major impact on the charities this last year and the years going forward until we find new ways, which I'm going to suggest toward the end of the session, some other ways of giving you know, uh, in terms of handling that. But big differences here. Over 35 35 million people who had itemized the year before did not itemize last year. That's pretty significant. The other thing that does this significant is it eliminates that category for those 35 million people of IRS taking any part in auditing that page of the return, right? So if you have 35 million people who are no longer auditing, no longer filing Schedule A, then the correspondence exams that would cover Schedule A go away. So IRS can put its limited resources other places. Um, but what about capital gains? This was nifty. Nobody, everybody kept their mouth shut and nothing happened. There's not a word in that, you know, huge, huge tax bill that talks about capital gains. The rates were unchanged. In fact, the brackets and the stages that the rates go into weren't changed. So when it comes to the zero bracket amount, now what's a zero bracket about when it comes to capital gains? On a married filing a joint return, the capital gains rates is zero to the extent that the taxable income is under $78,750. And that taxable income, think about it, the taxable income is your total income after your standard deduction. So that's 78,750. Add on your 27,000 if you're over 65 on that, <clears throat> and you can have that total income for the year and pay zero taxes on your capital gains and qualified dividends. Because <coughs> uh, it's not just the long term capital gains. Now, as your income starts going up, you start paying 15% on the qualified dividends and capital gains on a joint return when the taxable income hits 78,000. And that rate will continue until you get to 488,000. So it'll be at a 15% rate. But once you get to 488,850, you'll pay a 20% rate. <coughs> but there's another hidden rate that goes on in addition to this. So the hidden rate in addition to this it's called the net investment income tax. So the net investment income tax comes in at joint return, I believe it's 250,000, single move is 200. So in the middle of that 15% bracket where we have the, oh my goodness, I'm only gonna pay 15% on anything between 78,000 and 488,000, looks real comfortable, yeah. But as soon as you hit that threshold of the 250, bang, you get to pay the net investment income tax special at 3.8 on top of it. So there's really five rates when it comes to capital gains. There's the zero, the 15, then 15 foot NII, which would be 18.3, and then there's the 20 plus 3.8 or 23.8%. Yes. It, was, it came in in the same legislation as those then. The Affordable Care Act brought in two types of additional add-ons. One of them was the net investment income tax. The other one was the, um, to pay for the Affordable Care Act, workers, because some people have some kinds of income, some people have others. Workers have an added on 0.9, which is paid into the Social Security system. 
and that's matched by employee, employers too. So you've got 1.8 additional commitment of the government on that. And that comes in about that same range, 200, 250,000 range. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Which one? Net investment uh, income? Oh, it, it's, uh, his question is, when you're talking about the net investment income and the threshold that trips it, the threshold that trips it that makes it subject to you is modified adjusted gross income. It's not taxable income. Yes, and so I want to, so thank you for, for mentioning that because it means that in that 15% bracket where it switches from 15 to the added 3.8, we can have people who have no taxable income okay, but still pay the net investment income tax because their income is such that their itemized, or their itemized deductions maybe for medical okay, or they've had a loss during the year that's wiped out everything. And we're not talking capital losses, we're talking about ordinary losses, presidentially declared disaster type losses. But losses wipe out everything else, but modified adjusted gross income will stand, and that's net investment income tax is applied at that level. Yes. Okay, so here's, here's his question. His question is, if I have um, my income at $100,000, we're talking taxable income of $100,000? Okay, and that's after my standard deduction, I'm at $100,000, and the only thing that generated that was capital gains. Yeah, so what that picture would be is on the first $78,750, you have got a 0%. On the excess over that, you've got the 15%. Yes, because it's all part of the part being taxed. Yeah. Okay, so changes on that one. If we if we stay quiet, maybe they won't notice it. That's one of the theories that I have about tax legislation. Okay, if we find something good, my son complains constantly. Mom, every time you go back east and, and complain about something that's being administered, my folks, my clients get hit better. You know, <laughs> so hit worse. So. Um, so we will keep it quiet about these rates and how they are affecting uh, investors and, uh, and let it run the way it is and then just work with the ones that affect the majority of people. But you know, the tax rates themselves aren't the only thing that affects your pocketbook related to your income. And I put this in because several years I noticed, several years ago, gosh, I noticed my clients getting hit with their Medicare premiums being changed. The Medicare premiums get changed every November. So the letters will go out toward the end of November telling you your premium for next year is going to be. Well, your premium for the year 2020 is based on the modified adjusted gross income that you had in 2018. And maybe you've noticed that if you have a really good year and your income pops up real high for one year, bang, your, your Medicare premiums go from the basic to, to up to, I mean, they can go if you, had, if you had a large capital gain. Say you sold your principal residence and you had a capital gain that exceeded the 500000 exclusion. So you have one year that's just a huge number and, and that the amount of modified adjusted gross income exceeded 500000 for singles or 750 for married couples. That would cause your premium for your Medicare to go from what would be starting at 144 per month to 491 a month. Now that to me is an amazing penalty hit. So when you're doing your year in planning, look, look at the picture in terms of, am I going to cross one of these thresholds too? For several years before the rules changed on you can't do do-overs on Roth IRA conversions, I would work with a select number of my clients who had this goal of doing a Roth conversion. And what we would do is we'd build a model of what the year looked like and we would pull over and convert enough money to keep us under the thresholds. I mean, like how much is, is the threshold that you don't want to pay any more than this? Because it's not just looking at the income tax, it's looking at the every single month what's going to go into your bank account from, from Social Security, which is the Medicare. Any questions on this chart and what it means? Yes. Modified adjusted gross income. Yeah. 
Okay, so every time they pass a law that's going to spin off of an element of the tax return, they look at it in terms of add-ons and not taxed income. So modified adjusted gross income for purposes of the Medicare B premiums takes your adjusted gross income and it adds back your tax-exempt munis. So a lot of people aren't, aren't aware of this gotcha. You think your tax, your munis are not taxable? Well, sometimes they're not, okay? but there are things that are, can make them taxable. And the, the amount of the tax-exempt municipal bond interest gets added to adjusted gross income for purposes of where you fall in this table. That's what it's looking at. Is there another question about this? Yes. Yeah. Can we wait for a microphone, please? You gave the example of uh, selling a house and having a large income one year. Mm -hmm. The next year, your income goes down. Does this drop drop away? Exactly. It's it's recalculated every year, and there is an acceptance that is. Um, I tell the clients go for it and make the request because you're not going to get it if you don't try. And when you get that November letter that says we're raising it, if you believe that the situation that caused you to have the spike in income is not likely to recur, that it was a one-time thing, then you can petition Social Security Administration and say, but please, 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 okay, I, I didn't mean to do it, or uh, my spouse passed away and this generated additional income because of the transitions that are related to it. And they have the authority to grant relief. And, and my clients are running at least a 50% on that. So if you get a letter and you see it like that says your premium is going up and you believe it was a unique thing that caused it, there isn't a petition that you can do to request that it be put back down to the normal rates. Yes, there's a microphone on that side. Yeah. Uh so that income there, does Social Security income count towards those uh, amounts? And also, uh, there's also a prescription uh, Part D surcharge as well. Yes. Okay. So two things. Uh, when it comes to, I'm looking at Medicare B, but if you also have the payment payments for the prescription drugs, that, that also is affected. And they have a similar chart for it that says it's going to jump in the same level. The first part of your question, though, was, is Social Security income part of your mo modified adjusted gross income? The answer is yes. Anything that goes in is going to be taxed there as part of it. Okay, so that's another gotcha as you do your year in planning. Look at this one, too. Um, at least don't, don't be blindsided by it. Be aware that, we, that, uh, that it, it is something that should go into calculation. So... I'm going to start by asking, did you have any problems with last year's filing season? Because many wage earners were surprised that their withholding wasn't enough. And that same phenomena hit pension holders. If you have been having withholding on your pension income, then that too was reduced down. So what caused the reduction of the withholding? Well, I believe it was an intentional manipulation to get more money in circulation immediately after this tax bill passed so that it looked like the economy was doing really, really well. Because uh, most people, if they have extra money in their paycheck, are gonna spend that money, right? So that's what had happened. Uh, the people had gotten their withholding tables had been adjusted lower, uh, theoretically, because everybody's gonna pay less in tax. And a lot of people rely on that withholding to cover their tax. So there was a whole lot of people who were blindsided this last filing season by finding out that we're not getting a refund. Some people plan on that refund to do the spring break with the kids or to do the family vacation in the summer. Well, that was off the table for a lot of people. The, um, for others, it was putting them in a situation where they had an underpayment of estimated tax. Now, I gotta tell you on this one, I. I am among one of the voices who was out there constantly saying, IRS, you can do something about this. And uh, I write a blog for Forbes, I'm not terribly active at it, but this is one that was, got me so upset 
that I submitted it to my editor in January, not January, you know, toward fall of the end of last year, indicating this alarm about how many people I was seeing who were having their withholding having been reduced were going to owe extra money. And I was saying, you're, you're putting people into a situation where they pay unpayment and taxes. And so while I put issue at the feet of the current commissioner of IRS, because I thought he could do something about it, my editor switched it so the way the article read is, Mr. Trump, here's something you can do. Okay. And, and what that was, was to make it so that um, the underpayment of estimated tax penalty, instead of applying if you were at less than 90%, they ended up moving it twice during filing season as they saw more and more people. In fact, they, it, it took place mostly after April 15th when we see the number of people who were impacted by this penalty. Um, IRS actually dropped it down to an 80% tolerance instead of a 90% tolerance. Any of you who got a penalty early on, you may not have had to pay that penalty. So if you paid it early and quick, I don't know how many of them got your money back because they aren't, aren't good at just giving money back like that. But um, this year we're back up to the normal 90%. You've got to be within a 90% accuracy on these estimated payments. Um, and IRS has been working all year and they have released within the last month a new program it's an app online, it's IRS at GOV, to help people reset their withholding so that they can figure out. When you take away and eliminate from a system, a system that was based on how many exemptions do you have, and since they set exemptions to zero and basically eliminated them, how could you use that system anymore? Okay? Just a little, little quirky problem. So they've been working on a new development to try to get you to something that would be close to the, the rates. And it's online. Yes. Segue on, on what you just said about them changing it by not till April 15th. I'm of the opinion, and I want to ask if you agree, that the best strategy is to pay it on April 15th, even if you've got it figured out two months ahead. You mean to file, file your taxes April 15th, even last, if you know? Yeah, the last possible moment. Okay. Years and years ago, it made sense to be one of the last filers. And April 15th, hey, there's October 15th. Okay, so years and years ago, the theory was because IRS is based on a fiscal year that ends September 30, and in terms of the audit roulette challenge, and this, this goes back ooh, a long time because I've been doing this well in excess of 40 years. So, and that, at that point in time, it made a difference. Why? Because we're doing everything by paper. And in doing things by paper, if the fiscal year ended September 30, and IRS had to have their audit plan in place starting uh, October 1st, if they didn't have your tax return, then it wasn't going to be in the first group pulled, was it? And especially if you had the right to file it up to October 15th, why would you want to file in April and put your return in the roulette wheel? As returns have moved to electronic returns, and about 80% of the returns submitted to IRS today are electronically filed. Many of you might use TurboTax or an online service provider to, to file your tax returns. They're filed electronically. IRS pulls the ones and the, the data graphics and analytics they use are based on electronic filing. So I can't say, although I still do file close to April, October 15th every year personally, <laughs> um, I can't tell you that it's getting you the kind of break it used to in terms of keeping you out of the audit roulette. What's keeping you out of the audit roulette right now is the lack of funds that IRS has given to administer the law. That and your close attention to matching and making sure you include on your tax return anything generated a 1099. I mean, don't, don't think, oh, I'm not going to report this one or they won't know about this. It doesn't work. Uh, to, on that in similar subject, last year was the first time in all the years I paid taxes where uh, well, I paid it, I, I sent it in two weeks before the due date. And on the 12th of April, I had a amended K-1 form come in. And I also had one from a company that raised uh, my tax liabilities by a by thousand dollars. And I, so I had to submit an amended tax after that. It, is that related to the tax, the new tax law or just random? I've never seen this before. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I think that the people that 
have prepared the partnership entity returns had a huge, huge challenge to try to do the law correctly, okay? Because there were so many changes that affected businesses and limitations and everything else and the, and the new qualified business deduction, which I'm gonna to touch on at the very end. So I think that this year we did see a lot more late K-1s. But when you have a situation like that, do I have to file an amended return? There is nothing in the law that requires an amended return. You should file an amended return. You should file an amended return and pay your tax. But I, I know we had a similar issue for years with these 1099 DIVs that you'd get two and three versions of them because they were coming out. And now they, the companies ask IRS, can we postpone the uh, end of January filing date? Okay. And some of you don't get your 1099 DIVs until mid-March, do you? Because of the type of investments you have. I mean, have you ever thought about what that does to the people who assist you with your tax preparation? The more complex return you have and not getting that information until four weeks before it's due, and you're not their only client, okay? So they get inundated in a four-week period and can't finish the returns that they started in February because they're waiting for that stuff. But with those constant changes, sometimes those changes make $50 difference in the income. Would you amend a return because you got a dividend that's $50 higher than the other one you got? Even if it's higher and you owe now owe the government $12.10, okay? I wouldn't do it with my personal return. Okay? Um, th there's, within the, the administration of the law, there's a thing called the law enforcement manual. And the law enforcement manual says, at what point do we consider an amount worth proceeding in any compliance areas? When you look at it and say $10 and some odd cents, that's well below that compliance level. Okay. The other part of it is I prepare my own return, and I have for years, and I prepare lots of returns for other people. I cannot tell you that that return that I prepared is 100% correct. Okay. Even on my own return, I can't tell you that. And this has been an issue that I've raised to the national level for 30 years, is that it's a best efforts. It's I do my darndest to prepare my own return correctly with all the information I believe is correct okay, that I've received. But what confidence level do I have in the information that I received? Okay. Just because it came from Morgan Stanley, I thought it was correct. And a month later, I get another one from Morgan Stanley that is now more correct. Okay. So, so you have that issue of, well, what, what, is, what is a correct return? It has to be your best efforts to get to a correct return at the point that you file the return. Now, the admitted returns, as I said, there's a Supreme Court case, Badaraco, that had to do with someone trying to correct a return and IRS refusing to take the admitted return. In that particular case, the, the taxpayer had committed fraud on his first submitted return, and he wanted to not deal with that seven-year statute. He wanted to reduce the statutory period they could go after him for that fraud. So he filed an amended return thinking that would do it. IRS said, yeah, we've looked at it, but we're not gonna take it. So he fought that up to the Supreme Court and the court's decision was that amended returns are a creature of administrative grace, that IRS doesn't have to take them. And we turn that 100 degrees or 180 degrees and we say, okay, so I don't have, I don't have an issue with fraud. I have a change I received from a K-1 and I review the return, put the other information in, and I find out I owe $100. Am I gonna amend that return? The decision point in it, and we're getting way off our topic on this stuff, but the decision point on that issue is, a real life human being has never looked at your return at all until you submit that paper return and ask them to look at it and see if, if it's okay for you to pay that extra $100 it's okay for them to give you another $100 back. If I owe the money, I'm more likely to want to file the return and, and take care of it. If they owe me $100, I look at it and say, what's that worth to me? Thinking that someone is gonna look at my return, and my return's 
not a thin return. And, and for the first time, eyes are going to look at that. And I know that a lot of this work is done by clerks at the service center, but they are a sentient being who can look through and say, does this make sense? And that might make me want to pass up that hundred bucks for that trade-off. So there's not a law that says you absolutely have to do it. You should do it. Your, your goal is to file compliant tax returns, re reporting the correct amount of tax, and my goodness, let's hope they're correct amount of tax. Because if they're challenged, you work towards substantial correctness when you negotiate with the agent in terms of is this, did the taxpayer try to comply with the law? Okay, so a lot of people were surprised that their withholding wasn't enough, and this applied to pensioners as well as, as wage earners. And uh, the IRS did change the tables again this year. What a lot of people don't realize that is if you have a withholding source, like wages or a pension, you aren't limited by saying, oh, I have to choose a number of exemptions or, or units, because since we don't have exemptions anymore, you can actually put on them, take $300 per pay, per pay period. Pay per month or invest a bed for now. That would be a choice of those that require. Uh, other winners and losers, we, we'll talk about that. We talked about the winners with the AMT and the benefit that we have with now finally not seeing as much of that. Another quirky thing flowed from that no longer having an AMT. Many of you probably, maybe I don't know if you noticed or not that had a release of accumulated AMT credits from last year. Anyone recognize that on the return? And say, where did this come from, right? Yeah, where did it come from? You, you had, yeah, you had alternative minimum tax that you paid in prior years for an adjustment or a preference item, and you weren't able to use those credits because you were having to pay AMT each year. So last year, you didn't have to pay AMT, so the credits popped up, and, and we're allowed to reduce your income from the regular tax down to the alternative minimum tax. So you might have a few more years of it, or what I saw from many of my clients is that small amount of, of credits were released. And so I said, so don't think this is gonna happen every year, but you, you had a bumper year this year, it, it worked in your favor. Let's see. Higher standard deduction than federal helped offset the loss of many items previously itemized. It also helped offset the loss of the exemptions. Now, we saw those amazing jumps in the standard deduction. Wow, $24,400. That's fantastic to have as a standard deduction. But let's say that's for a family of four, and that family of four previously had had four personal exemptions. And those four personal exemptions were running at over $4,000 each. So we have 24,000, we can say, wow, look how much we can take as our standard deduction. And we used to get over 16,000 as a personal exemption amount, and now it's zero. So how much did that help? 24 less 16, standard deduction equivalent is now, what, $8,000? They were getting at least that before. So a lot of it to me, smoke and mirrors, and some people were injured by this. Um, some of the winners in the, this category, though, were young families in our valley with children. And I say that because to make up for taking away that personal exemption, a child credit came, came in at $2,000. A credit is a dollar-for-dollar dollar reduction in tax. It's real money. So that $2,000 per child, the reason I'm saying we saw winners in our valley here is our wage base seems is much higher than many parts of this country. And previous to these law changes, a lot of people in the valley here did not get the benefit of uh, credits for their children because their wages looked like they were too high. Of course, it cost them two or three times as much for the pay for their housing here than anywhere else. But for these people, and, I, and, and my son was one of the people that was affected by this, he had been in that spot where he hadn't been able to get the child credit before. Last year, he got the child credit, and it was $2,000, significant, because they raised the, the amount that a couple can have before it disappears to 
to four hundred thousand dollars so a whole lot more people in this valley with the benefit of the child credit they also brought in a credit to um, make up for the fact that a child only lasts until the child is 17 and can you get them out of your home at that point no so they're probably still in your home and they're at a, an extensive part of their life too so since that child credit only lasts until a person is 17, they created an other credit, an other credit of only $500. And this other credit applies to the kids that are over 17 and parents that are living in the house or anyone that would otherwise qualify as a dependent, even though, you know, see, see some of the obstacles they ran into by the quick passage of this bill without having normal people that write tax bills write it was that they didn't look at the nuances in the words and so they still have had things that existed in the law like dependents and exemptions when they'd eliminated exemptions so some of the stuff is let's figuring out what still applies the $500 other credit for a person who could be a dependent but is no longer a child Came into being this last year too. Is that helpful? Let's see, now here's something that shocked a lot of my clients because I had clients come in, have their returns prepared, and because they heard over and over again, well, the exemption is so high, most people won't itemize. They didn't bring their information with them, and I had to say, well, you need to go get it anyway because, whereas the federal standard deduction was up there at 24,000 for a joint return. California's was at 8,000. So we had a whole lot of instances this last year, more than ever before, where when you prepared your California return, you needed to itemize your deductions. Otherwise, your standard deduction of eight didn't capture everything. Because easily your property taxes, your charitable contributions, and if you had a loan on the home, could easily exceed 8,000, even if they weren't able to on the federal. I often refer to California as the United State of California uh, because it's got its own system. And it did not change that system this year either. 23 states did not follow the federal government last year when the federal government changed their tax rules. 23. Why? Because in most of their states, their revenue would have gone down if they followed lockstep with what the federal did and the states couldn't afford to lose the revenue. In California, I don't know whether it's just being obstinate or just the way we do things here, but there was very little changes even this year that conformed to the federal. So you're gonna have another year where do your return both ways. Put all of the information in as if you were gonna itemize on your federal return because that information is useful to do the California return. That was a, a major difference between the, the, the two. So, let's see, going to some key issues. Filing season, unfinished business. The unfinished business that we're going to talk about this, and, and I'm going to give you some more detail on, has to do with the Qualified business deduction, which I think I've mentioned over in this one here. Well, rental properties in QDI. How many of you own rentals? Okay, so we're going to get to that subject in a few minutes. Um, but when it comes to unfinished business, there was a lot of misunderstanding about the qualified business deduction and who it applied to. There was a lot of misunderstanding about the limitation of the itemized deductions, especially when it came to mortgage interest. So when it comes to those categories, we're going to dig into those a little bit deeper and make sure that you understand what the choices are and um, if there's any planning that you can do around those things. So what's new for the 1040? Oh my goodness, could it have happened at a better time? How many of you remember last year's 1040 form as being so difficult to read? Does anyone remember this? Do you remember the great huge with big fan for when, when Secretary Mnuchin came out and announced, we have a postcard size 1040. B.S. Okay. Um, yeah. That postcard size, 
Sin 40 was a huge failure. At New York University this year, I was on the podium with the, the assistant commissioner for SBSC, that's small business and self-employed people, and I was commenting on the extreme difficulty of reading a tax return last year. And I, I made some comment about any of you who have, in the audience who've tried to read your return will understand why I'm asking this question. And I had told her beforehand that I was going to put this out on the, for discussion about that ridiculous form. And she said, this was a policy decision. Do you know what policy decision means? It means IRS didn't have a choice. It wasn't their fault. They came out with a stupid form. It was a policy decision because it was going to make a political statement about, we have simplified your taxes. I didn't see anything really much simpler than um, for the few people who took a standard deduction who hadn't before, maybe that was simpler. But the form that they put it together for last year was so ridiculous. It killed a whole lot of trees from one perspective because they took a form that had been front and back and they said, we're going to make it so that it's um, postcard size, but they didn't shrink it to exactly half. And then all of the things that they took off of it, they added to five schedules. Okay. And, and the schedules, some of them had six lines on it. Some of them were a quarter of a page, a third of a page, five different pages. I know for my personal return, I had that stupid short form that I couldn't find how to check it, okay? But then I had five of the five pages were following it, and that meant nothing to me either. So without my two-year comparison, I had trouble seeing by category, because my software generates a category by category. This is what you had the year before, this is what you had this year, so that I could check my own return and, and other people's returns too. I was so frustrated by that. Um, so at, at, at which point I, I commented that, you know, I guess they did the best they could considering it was out of their control that they had to use that form, that it must have cost you a fortune. But there was one requirement that came through with the legislation the last year or so that did mandate that IRS create a new tax form, and that is the 1040 SR. Yes, SR stands for seniors. And looking at the room today, I would say most of you are going to qualify for this form. Okay? You only have to be 65 to qualify for this form. And so in that presentation, I suggested that perhaps if IRS would go back to the 2017 version of the 1040, that that would help us all in dealing with uh, at least those people over 55, and then maybe give people an option to elect into using it. So I was very pleased when I saw the 1040 SR, because the 1040 SR, sure enough, goes pretty much back to the way the form looked in 2017. So you'll see the familiarity of it. The difference is, to qualify to use the 1040 SSR, SR, you may not itemize. So at the bottom of what would take up the full page, they, uh, elim they put in standard deduction amounts. So you, you have to... Um, yeah, well, I've got a little more on a little bit later, but the 1040 SR, a lot of people will be able to use it. It's, it's a major improvement because at least it's readable as opposed to the others. And when it comes to those five forms that just drove us crazy because you tried to relate them and stuff, IRS is slowly creeping back to an understandable form. Instead of having five schedules that you attach to it, there's now only three. Okay? So we've made 40% of the progress that we need to make to get back to something that's readable. But on the other side of it, the um, number of people who actually prepare paper tax returns has shrunk. 80% of the returns IRS receives are done electronically. So with those returns going in electronically, it's, um, do they really need to, to worry about the way the return gets printed out? But I don't know about you guys, how, how do you check your own returns? And how do you check it? For me, sometimes I, there's schedules that I need to print out so I can check through and see if it got the information I gave it. And many of my clients still prefer to see a paper return that they can read through. Um, yeah. So when it says fewer number of schedules, that does not mean they reduce the number of, 
of like schedule A, B, C, D, they didn't eliminate any of those. Well, actually for, for 2019, they did eliminate the C, E, Z, because they figure you can use the regular schedule C. And they did eliminate um, one of the foreign forms because it can be combined into another one, but most of that doesn't change. Um, so new for this next year, we're going to see a higher standard deduction, um, fewer of those numbered schedules, and the new SR form. See, doesn't he look happy? To, yeah. And it said it's more like 40 from 2017. Uh, you must use the standard deduction. And, and here's what they, <laughs> they increased the size of the fonts and they made the color contrast. So if you're doing a return on a computer, do you see the color contrast? Yeah, no, because it doesn't do the blues and the lesser blues. Uh, but they did include it, have sp better spaces between the lines on it to be quite a cram things in. So that's what the form's going to be. And don't be surprised if you see it. You just have to be old enough to qualify to use it. And it has on it basically the kind of most frequently used lines on the form that a person who was a retiree might have. It has the section for pensions. Uh, they did increase, one of, the, one of the faults they had, they have a heck of a time auditing tax returns uh, on the computers for the year 2018. The reason they're gonna have a heck of a time doing it is because they did not gather the information in a way that allows them to check it easily. For example, last year when it came to pensions and IRAs, they put them both on the same line and they didn't include a gross amount, taxable amount. This year they've now got one line for pensions and one line for IRAs back again. They've got the gross amount and the taxable amount. Um, it, it just was not as well coordinated in the short period of time they had with the people that once a return gets into the system, they've got to be able to review it and to, to apply the systems that they have to say, what are the discrepancies? What are the things that we can write people about and say they don't match. There was not as much thought put into the second part of the picture. They diverted the staffing to try to get through creating the forms and stuff in the first place. So um, I have heard some words that to the effect that 18 will be pretty much of a wash year when it comes to being able to audit the returns. But when you do get selected for audit, and who can say who's gonna win that roulette game, um, it's gonna be a heck of an audit. Here's a, a, a issue that I will go into more after, aren't we coming up to a break, Lynn? We got five minutes or what? Oh, 15 minutes, okay, then I'll cover this topic then. Okay, so this is something new on the returns and I wanted to call it your attention because it's gonna be what I think of uh, as a fairly big deal over the next five years. I don't know how many of you were involved in or heard of the IRS Offshore Voluntary Compliance Initiative, and that targeted, it ended in the last year or so. Not that it ended, it, IRS got all the low-hanging fruit, and so now they're continuing on in some areas, but, but they think they've got the message out that you have to, to let them know if you have a bank account in a foreign country. It's uh, not just the checkbox at the bottom of the Schedule B, which says, do you have an account in a foreign country? It's a form 8938 that says, here's the information about my account in a foreign country, if you've hit a certain tolerance level. Well, that compliance initiative generated millions and millions of dollars for IRS. And here's what I believe is going to rise up and take its place over the next year or so. And that's the issue of virtual currency. In fact, they have added a phrase, a line on the tax return this next year as a way of trying to see if people will be voluntarily reporting their income on this. So those people who had offshore accounts who um, ignored answering the question about, do you have an offshore account, yes or no? That became an issue that IRS, if they failed to answer that or, they, or their preparer put in no, IRS took it to mean that they intentionally were not disclosing information about the foreign account and went for amazing penalties when they finally caught the people. So on this one, they're trying that same approach by adding a line to the tax return that says, at any time during 2019, did you receive, sell, 
send, exchange, or otherwise acquire any financial interest in any virtual currency? Yes, no. <clears throat> what if you have a well-known uh, brokerage like uh, Vanguard that have billions, and so you, you don't know about it, but uh, does that make you responsible if you don't know anything about it? Well, last year we had IPOs of virtual currencies, I mean, which, which kind of blew me away because this whole area started in 2008 when Bitcoin and a couple others announced we don't trust the central bank system, so we're going to create our own. So it, in that short span of just over 10 years, to see market makers create mutual funds in this, and as you say, some of the noted, noted air, uh, financial companies hold it. Now, if you're holding a mutual fund at Vanguard that has a virtual currency in it, I don't think that's the same thing. This, I think this is direct, tangible ownership of it. So, um, but, but to me, the placement of this question is actually on one of those supporting schedules. I think it's on schedule one, the top of that, where you're supposed to check it. And the instructions actually say, if you have no other reason to file schedule one than to check this, then do so. If, if you don't have this, you don't have to file Schedule 1. Okay. Like I said, I think it's put your foot in the ring. Didn't we have something in the last week or two with the hearings on, on Facebook is trying to set up their own currency, virtual currency? And AT&T announced that they were going to take virtual currency and payment of AT&T bills? I mean, and I, I went back this last week to Safeway, which isn't, isn't too far from here, because I had walked, as I was leaving it after buying my groceries, and sitting in front of the little bank in there had been a machine that allowed you to um, turn your virtual currency into cash if you needed to buy groceries, and they weren't taking it. And now we're finding other companies that are willing to take virtual currency as part of normal transactions. So for some of us who are stuck in a different generation, we may have trouble saying bricks and mortar, bricks and mortar, you know, and, and, and what's supporting this stuff. But there's a lot of things going on out there with this particular category. And from my understanding, IRS's biggest interest in this is because when they went out through the offshore accounts for people who had money in Switzerland and some of the other uh, havens, a lot of those people decided, well, then they go to a virtual currency, which wasn't trackable, they thought, okay, which wasn't going to be trackable, and they would put their, their funds there. So earlier this year, IRS began a compliance campaign. And I think the compliance campaign ran, was created about the same time, the gentleman from Criminal Investigation of IRS, um, I have a, a poster in my office in the lobby. It's a picture of Al Capone. And it says it took an accountant to get to catch Al Capone. Uh, but it was from, it's a recruiting poster for the Criminal Investigation Division of IRS. They're accountants with guns. Okay? Sounds scary. But they are also the best in the world at tracking the movement of funds. And earlier this year, they tracked a child pornography ring that hit several major companies countries, not just ours, because the people were using cryptocurrencies to pay for their transactions. And they brought down this huge, huge child pornography ring, which, I, I'm, which is disturbing at a different level. But the point that I'm trying to make is that I have heard people say, IRS is so inept, they'll never be able to capture this. So no, they took the same kind of skills that brought down that enormous ring, and they, they know who's out there using the cryptocurrency. So earlier this year, they put out 10,000 letters this summer, 10,000 letters to individuals. There were three kinds of letters. The first kind of letter says, we believe that you may not have understood that your investments in cryptocurrency and virtual currency were taxable. 
please amend your tax return. Please review your return and if necessary, amend your return. There are three categories. The, the two of these three categories were soft notices. The second one was even softer. Please be aware that we believe that you may have, have some investments in this that weren't reported. The third category is we have information about your movements on the internet and we will expect the tax return changing, amending your return within the next 30 days. So that one was the, but Chuck Reddick, who's currently commissioner of IRS, Chuck is the co-author on the book that I wrote on tax practice and procedure, he and Bill Wiggins. And, and I, I was in a session with Chuck earlier this summer and he was saying, Claudia, I watch the media. I see how they're saying, IRS can't do this. They, ju they just don't have the skill or the expertise. He says, when we sent out the 10,000 letters, we didn't go through a phone book and pick every 10th name okay, and, and send them the letter. He says, if we've got your name and we've got your address, we know you had some transactions in this currency or we wouldn't have sent you the letter. He says, so don't, don't underestimate what we are able to now do with data analytics. His term as commissioner is going to be marked by pushing the IRS to use more and more data analytics in their approaches to finding people and doing things. So um, with the virtual currency, okay, they're taxable by law. And when it comes to it, I know for, for some of us would say, so what can you spend this stuff on and, and what does it mean? I have a note here. So when it comes to the virtual currency, um, IRS, what we see on the screen here is the IRS definition that follows that box. And it says virtual currency is a digital representation of value that functions as a medium of an exchange, a unit of account, and or a store of value. And then it goes on with words that it does not have to be legal tender in the US. It is not recognized as a currency in the U.S., which is, is a problematic because we're saying, well, well, what is it then? How do we treat it? They do agree that um, it's a capital asset, though. So how do you come in contact with it? What do you use it for? There's three different categories. Uh, when it first came out, a lot of people were talking about, oh, I'm going to mine this stuff. Well, mining it, best I can, can tell from reading it over and over again, is that you set up a very high-powered computer that constantly is looking out in the internet to find little pieces of it that were left behind or, or what, and, and collect them. That's mining it. It takes a lot of computing power. There's still some people doing it. Do you have income as soon as your computer finds this stuff and puts it into your account? Yes. It's like a treasure trove. You found it, it's income to you, the point that you mine it. Second way people use it is they invest in it. And if you invest in it and it's a capital asset and you hold it for a period of time and then you sell it, then you're going to have a capital gain or loss. The issue you run into is what was it worth at the point that I bought it in the first place? Now, most of you would know that you've got a track basis, right? So you track basis by saying at the time I bought it, this is the number of US dollars that were converted into it. At the time I sold it, this is the time, number of US dollars that, that came out. And you have a gain or loss. I can tell you in my practice, what I've seen is that there were clients who had some fairly hefty losses. And they had never mentioned that they even invested in this stuff until they had the loss. And they wanted to know, what am I going to do about it? Well, we can take a loss on it. You just have to admit that you've got it. And you've got to be able to show how you arrived at those numbers. The third category, and the one that's the most troublesome to IRS, is the category where someone is using the virtual currency to conduct business. Because you've got lots and lots of transactions. If I were investing in it, I'd have a going in and a coming out, right? If I were transacting business in it, I would have multiple times a day where I was receiving it, and then I would have the purchase of my cost of goods sold or my operating expenses, and those would be at, at many transactions. And the, the problem becomes that currency fluctuates enormously, sometimes by the hour. In the past two weeks, 
the premier of China announced that he thought that that was going to be the next great place to put uh, money. That currency jumped from 7,500 to 10,000 within two hours. I think it's back down closer to 79. I, I printed out and brought a list of the top five currencies and what they're trading for. But they move constantly. So if you're transacting business in this, then you need to be able to say, at 11 a.m. on Wednesday, I received this amount, and here's my U.S. dollar equivalent. And at 2.30 p.m., I received this amount, and here's my U.S. dollar equivalent. So you've got to have a real-time method of tracking the money and converting it to U.S. dollars. And that's, that's the issue. Um, in the last several years, there have been several exchanges that pop up, and they're still within that category. They're still trying to find which is the exchange that is going to be the ultimate exchange, kind of like we have Greenwich Mean Time. Okay? So what, what, what time of the day in which country are they going to say, here's the standard that we're going to base it out, and we're going to put on information to say what it was valued at. And that. Yes. So, and that's different from like if we got Swiss francs and started buying things with Swiss francs, right? Okay. So his question is, if, how is this similar or different from if, we're, if we are investing in Swiss francs or the euro? Let's say I go to Europe and I get, you know, $1,000 worth of Swiss francs. Yeah. I, mean, I guess it's euros now. And I spend it. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, it is a business transaction that I'm doing. So if it's so a there's business no transaction. Taxable, there's no taxable events from when I exchange it or, you know, I'm not making money on it, right? I mean, right. But in this case, it's different. Okay, so the difference between what we just described right. is if you're on a business trip, for example, and you convert to the local currency, then you are going to, to know how that money is spent, and you've got a, a point that you can go to saying, what was it trading for on that day? U.S. Treasury has a website, and when you prepare the forms for your foreign currency reporting, and the 8938, if you use the U.S. Treasury website, it'll tell you uh, what specific dollar amount you can use for your conversion rates. So, and, and you do have that issue. I have clients who um, inherit money outside the country, and the day they inherit it, it's worth, let's say it's worth 90, and the day that they repatriate it, it's worth 92. So the date that they convert it, they've got a two gain from repatriating that money. But it can go the other direction too. It can be worth 90, and then when they bring it to the US, it's worth 89. Yeah. No, it's not a taxable event unless it's a business expense, and then you've got the dollars you spent for your business expense, yeah. I think the, the biggest difference is that we're used to working with, well, I converted $1,000 because I'm going on a vacation and I want to have spending money. And, and none of that sounds like a business issue at all. And we don't really keep track of small movements in that amount of money. But in something like this, it's constant, it's going on, and the U.S. government has not announced it as being a currency. And that's the part, of, they're, getting their, they're getting in their own way on this by not, you know, you can... You can either lead the way or you can trail behind. To me, our government is not leading the way on this, saying here's how we believe it can be handled, here's, here's a network for tracking the values and acknowledging it. And so by, by sitting back, they're exposing people who invest in this to um, a level of I don't know how it's supposed to be handled because our government hasn't stepped up and said, yes, it's a currency. Instead, they're saying, it's a capital asset, and you have to check each time. Now, the capital asset part, for someone who's doing an investment in the currency itself, yeah, maybe that works because it's not frequent transactions. But that concept doesn't work when a person is transacting business in it. And a lot of commerce is starting to be transacted in this currency. AT&T, when they made their announcements a couple of weeks ago that they would begin accepting this for payment of bills, said they had no intention of keeping it, they would convert it back to cash immediately, but that they were willing to accept it because people were starting to use it. Okay. Well, so, so that's part of the problem. We'll okay. have a break in five minutes. Okay. So, five minutes. so that's probably part of the issue that goes with it. You know, we, we hear the phrases, 
virtual currency, virtual money, um, digital currency, I think, is the umbrella that goes over this. And it's basically unregulated. It's issued and usually controlled by the developers and used and accepted among the members of a specific virtual community. By contrast, a dig digital currency is used by a central bank as a central bank digital currency. Our country has not accepted a central bank digital currency with this issue. And, and that, I think, is part of the problem. Now, this was a Wikipedia definition. I, I was in a session with a young attorney out of, um, I think she was Houston, but she was amazing because like those of us in this room, a lot of people our age have trouble relating to this. Well, she was probably in her um, late 30s. And she was able to discuss this stuff, bam, 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 knew exactly what all the different pieces were. And she was representing people who were having problems in the Texas area with IRS assaults on virtual currency pieces. Well, she pointed out that, that virtual currency can even include the kind of currency that you have with Pokemon, okay? where, you, where you go online and you buy with your US dollars some Pokemon virtual currency so that within the games and within their stores, you can use it. That too is a virtual currency. But it's not a digital currency because it isn't looked at and managed by a larger group. It stays within a small group. I thought that was an interesting thought on it. Now, Investopedia expands these concepts a little bit further and says virtual currency is a type of unregulated digital currency only available in electronic form. It's stored and transacted only through designated software, mobile or computer applications, or through dedicated digital wallets. And the transactions occur over the internet through secure dedicated networks. Virtual currency is considered to be a subset of the digital currency group which also includes cryptocurrencies, which exist within a blockchain network. And blockchain was central to the beginnings of Bitcoin and that because the blockchain network allowed security and the people who invested in this were given a key that they could track their funds and they could see where all the pieces were going. This is a, a new dimension, a new way of thinking of how of a type of an asset class, I would call it an asset class, um, because I personally have not tried using it. But when I saw the machine at the Safeway, right here in our own little valley here, that, that allowed people to go in and draw on their account to get the cash to pay for their groceries, um, that's when I said, how far removed from reality is either this or me, one of us, okay, in terms of where it's going. And what, what I need to force myself to learn more about it because to be able to help clients who do invest in it and who do have transactions, that's the scary part. Um, and with that, I think we will leave this topic and when we come back, we'll start with a new one. Okay, uh, 10, 12 minute break and then we'll start up again. We'll have the drawing. Uh, just one thing, folks. Good morning, all. Can you hear me? OK, uh, I do notice that those $5 donuts disappeared really quickly. I would have brought more, but that was uh, what was available. Uh, I want to I comment on one part of Claudia's talk about virtual currencies. If you go back and look in our archives, uh, I made a marathon three-hour pitch uh, last year, I think it was in February, covered about 10 different uh, major topics, one of which was blockchain, Bitcoin, virtual currencies, mining, all that stuff. Uh, so anybody that's thinking about that, I strongly suggest you, you might want to review those seven or eight. 10 pages. Uh, a blockchain is a ledger system and primarily will be used for uh, corporate transactions. Uh, Bitcoin has got all kinds of cousins and you'll find a listing of what was uh, being tracked by 
CNBC, excuse me, Yahoo at the time. Anyway, take a look and uh, caveat emptor. Uh, at that time, I think the SEC was thinking about uh, Bitcoin and its cousins as a commodity. And if you have a commodity in a brokerage account, a non-tax deferred account, the taxation is not the same as stocks. So when you make an exchange, as Claudia was uh, discussing, you got tax implications. So uh, you, you might just want to study up on that. And thank, thanks to her for bringing all that up. Okay. Uh, I also want to point out we, we have a whole bunch of new books. Uh, when we lost our good man, Al Zemslowski, we lost our, our raffle books. Uh, we've done a complete refresh. So what I did is I studied 200 books and selected the best 14 across a broad range of investing topics. So they're on the table back there. And now we're going to have a drawing to see who the lucky person is. The number is 586138. Oh, that's the one that's the one I have in my hand. Any winner? Hey, okay, young lady. Congratulations. It was worth coming, right? <laughs> okay. A uh, couple of comments about our January program. Uh, we haven't decided on the order of presentation yet, but we have two great speakers. Uh, first, uh, for those of you who have been here a while, uh, we've had Delta Investment Management talk a couple of times. Uh, they will review the uh, U.S. economy and its outlook. They have a really great recession predictor. They have a great free newsletter that comes out every Friday. If you haven't subscribed to that, it's, it's free. It's great. It's a good read on the economy, and uh, I, I heartily suggest it. Uh, Nick Atkinson will be the presenter and uh, should be a very good hour with, with he and his partner, Andrew Houghton. And I'm very pleased uh, to tell you that we're bringing Matthews Asia in. We've got a portfolio manager who knows three Oriental languages. Um, she manages the Asia small company, uh, or excuse me, China small company uh, fund. And uh, I worked really hard on this. Uh, I, I tried to contact the CEO, CIO, left messages, messages, never got a response. Then I discovered that the CEO just happened to live up the peninsula at a particular place, and I sent stuff to his house <laughs> and finally got a response on that. So it, in uh, January, we'll have Tiffany Xiao. She's a CFA. She's uh, got a uh, bachelor's and master's in, e in economics. And she's the uh, a key portfolio manager for Matthews Asia. Now, with, with what's going on with the trade conflict, uh, the, the uh, whole Asia problem with uh, the economies and, and uh, what's happening with China, which has really been sinking, I don't know if you're tracking that, but the their GDP is just rolling down a hill. So we're going to cover uh, the outlook for trade negotiations, uh, look at the uh, uh, small company opportunities in China, 
And I don't know whether those are in Hong Kong or whether they're A shares uh, that, that are based on, on the mainland. But uh, as, you, as you know, Hong Kong is a real mess. So if they ever come out of this, there's going to be some big opportunities for investing. So she'll cover key risks and opportunities in the region. And if you look at my presentation for China from the same one that we're, uh, we have Bitcoin and blockchain, uh, you'll find that I have, I don't know, five or six pages on China and their belt, uh, the, the silk, new silk road, they call it one belt, one road. So what they're doing is they're connecting China, mainland China and its uh, coastal ports all the way into Europe as a uh, big opportunity for trade. So I think the U.S. better uh, pay a lot of attention. Okay, so looking forward to it. I hope everybody will show up. Thank you. Okay, uh, quickly, uh, uh, Dale Parks, we owe you $5, so stop back at the reception desk on your uh, forever ticket. So uh, uh, that, and I was gonna have Celia do a minute on the national, uh, she'll do it quick and then we'll, then we'll move on. And on your survey forms, I would like all of you to comment if you wish on the issue of how many of you need handouts, one handouts, if we had a PDF file you could download a day or two before and you brought it in on your laptop or your computer, would that suffice? Because that's our second biggest expense in terms of having programs. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Um, again, welcome everybody. So just by show of hands, who's actually new to AAII? Oh, great, great. So three new members, wonderful. So hopefully um, everyone knows that we are a local chapter of AAII. There's probably several dozen of us around the country, uh, but National AAII, um, which is headquartered in Chicago, they run an annual conference um, that probably has anywhere from 300 to 500 attendees every year. So this year um, was my first time attending a national conference. It was held in Orlando, and um, it was just really a great experience. Um, just by show of hands, I, I know I saw two other local members at the conference. Anyone else attend that annual conference? Oh, great. So three members, because Jim was there too. <laughs> um, how about in years past? Were you able to make it to an event in the past year? Awesome, awesome. So um, next year's event is going to be in Las Vegas which will be a lot more convenient for those of, you know, of us on the West Coast. Um, but as I mentioned, this year was in Orlando, and I focused on going to the ones that um, did market updates and estate planning. Um, and some of the names that were, like, exceptional were, of course, James Paulson, um, Julie Jason, Wesley Gray was more on the um, technical uh, side. He's uh, uh, the founder of Alpha architect, uh, Med Faber, of course, um, and James O'Shaughnessy. So those were some of the ones that um, I attended and then some of the other sessions too. Um, they run like seven tracks, so there's really like something for everybody. Um, so um, hopefully that's something you will consider. Um, there's information on the national site, AAII.com, um, and then we have our website, SiliconValleyAAII.org, that has presentations from today's session, as well as past um, uh, presentations. So check that out. Um, and then a quick announcement. Um, I don't know if you want to do it, Lynn, or if we wanted to just uh, run I'll, through this. Well, just quickly, we, I, I've had this question come in to me. Uh, the SIG groups will be, uh, are, some of them go all year, but not all year. The investment discussion group that I run does not happen in December, but it happens all the other 11 months. The CME group, which is technical investing and the planning uh, does occur in December. Those two happen in December. So 
with that, thank you. And Claudia, sorry we took it a little too long on this, but anyway, uh, you can start up again. Okay, we're going to resume with discussion on Schedule A and then talk about some th things about what can happen in spite of it or with it. Um, and, and then we'll take more questions as we go through. So we started off today by talking about the far fewer people filing Schedule A than ever had before. And I think a lot of people were surprised about that and didn't change their patterns until they saw what happened this year in terms of, well, we can't take that. No, I don't need this. I don't need that um, for preparing a return. So, so let's walk through what happened on that, the changes we're going to see for 2019, and um, some thoughts on what you can do to maybe rock back and forth the usage of the Schedule A. In the past, the Schedule A deductions have been subject to an itemized deduction limit. And that was based on your adjusted gross income. I think the thing that was most obvious is that if you looked at the Schedule A and you're going down the far right-hand column, the numbers didn't add up to the amount that was the total at the bottom of it if your income exceeded a certain level. Now it does. All the numbers actually add up. There's fewer of them, but what they do, and there's no limit on the itemized deductions you can take once you exceed the threshold for itemizing. Probably the biggest, most notable issue had to do with what we call the SALT limitation, state and local taxes. And I've got, I mean, I'll give you generally what it is and then we'll go into more, more detail on it. This is the $10,000 limit on the itemized deduction for state and local taxes, which as I said beforehand is income taxes, property taxes, and um, personal property taxes. So the state disability in California is considered a state income tax too. So those four are the ones that I see most frequently that fit into this category that now is limited to $10,000, no matter how much you pay. One other small change on the Schedule A was that uh, you can no longer deduct foreign taxes that you pay on foreign real property. So if you have a home in another country that you pay property taxes on, that deduction is gone. So it isn't available. We're going to go into the SALT limitation. Um, there was the, a lot of confusion on the home mortgage interest deduction and the limitations on that. So we're going to step into that one, make sure that we understand what that means and what's still allowed. There's no deduction for home equity loan interest. No deduction. It's, it's gone. So the problem with that is that home equity indebtedness isn't always indebtedness. So it is not deductible because it, the answer is it depends. Like in taxes, everything depends. But for the home equity interest, it depends on how you use the money. Yes? Weren't past loans grandfathered? Not if they were home equity debt. And not if they didn't qualify under the, it depends on how you use the fund. We're going to go into that in more detail because there was so much confusion. I had a group in Hawaii last week they asked me if I would go through it, and I thought, this subject's a problem for people still, for preparers and things. And, and uh, they'd had someone come in to try to discuss what the rules were, and she bombed and said, I actually don't know. So, so, yeah, so we'll go through in more detail what this is so that you see the nuances of what is allowed and what isn't. Expired deduction for mortgage insurance. We're going to private mortgage insurance deduction. And that is eliminated too. No miscellaneous itemized deductions. Your expenses for your portfolio management, gone. Except for California, because California did not change these things. The federal government did. That, that home equity indebtedness from the 100,000 cap, California didn't change that. So if you did your return, you've got, you've got to be able to know that 
you can still take that up to $100,000, interest on up to $100,000 on your California return. Certain casualty and theft losses. This is, it's been so upset politically about what was done to casualty and theft losses. Uh, you can no longer take casualty and theft losses. Uh, and my comment publicly was that I've never seen anyone make a profit on the, their home being burned down. And in California, we have uh, a number of incidents this, just in the last month or so. I had two family members who had to get evacuated where they live because of fires. But our California incidents were not considered presidentially declared disaster areas. That means all of those people impacted were not allowed, will, will not be allowed to take a casualty and theft loss because their homes are on federal terms because their homes were not declared a presidentially declared disaster or federally declared disaster. A couple years ago, when Santa Barbara had the fires and mud storms, and our current administration chose not to call it a public disaster, or a national disaster, the legislators included in a tax bill that was the bipartisan budget reconciliation, they included Santa Barbara and said we will declare it a federally declared disaster area. Hoping that that will happen again as we come up again for the budget reconciliation in the next month or so. But uh, incredible damage. It also meant that people were not getting FEMA support to help with all the problems. Anyway, all of these things that were changed, um, and then we ended up with a higher threshold for security. So let me go through in more detail. You had, you had a question? Sir? Wait for the mic, please. Thanks, Russ. What is the what? The limit on home mortgage interest, I've how got, much? I've got several slides on it. We'll go through it in detail in just a moment. We'll, go through, we'll go through it in just a moment. Yeah. So hang, hang on to your question. We'll, we'll approach it we'll again. So think at the top of the Schedule A. We're going to step through that. Self-employed taxpayers who qualify for medical insurance adjustment can still take their medical insurance and adjust for self-employed people. Items or categories that constitute deductible medical expenses have not changed. But for 2019, taxpayers must absorb medical expenses equal to 10% of your adjusted gross income. If 10% if sounds familiar, it's because it was put in and taken out, and put in and fell out. So we're back this year with saying it's a 10% um, medical expenses tolerance before you can take a deduction on your federal return. California is still seven and a half. I can tell you that this is one of the provisions in the extender legislation that is hoped to be dealt with before the end of this year. It may not be. We don't know what's going to happen. But um, I have been warning my clients that they may have to absorb more of their medical expenses themselves because of this 10% limit for the AGI limit. What category of medical expenses is growing exponentially? Yeah, care, senior care, okay. Uh, care for people who are not able to take care of themselves. So qualified long-term care services is growing so fast and the cost of it is so outrageous. And a lot of people don't, um, don't understand what the components of it are that make it deductible. So like, when is it? A long-term care expense is deductible when the person receiving that care has lost two of the six activities of daily living. So you, you hear people talk about their activities of daily living. If you buy long-term care insurance, they usually list what activities of daily living are covered. But when a person moves into an assisted living facility, because they are losing some of the activities of daily living, the entire cost, the entire cost becomes a medical expense because you can't live on your own. You can't live independently on your own at the point that you have started losing some of these activities of daily living. Yeah. You're paying these expenses for parents. Would your parent otherwise qualify as a dependent? 
Probably not because their income, yeah. Okay, so if her only income is Social Security, then she probably doesn't have a filing requirement and she wouldn't have taxable income that would put her past the, the threshold. So the answer would be she would be qualify as your dependent. And the answer is yes. And California even has a special credit for people who take care of family members in their home. Or who take care of the family members cost. Um, and the key thing on this, it isn't, you don't have to parse the expenses out. For example, my mother passed away last year, but for the four years prior to that, she lived in a facility that was a continuing care. Okay? Some people moved there totally independently, and they lived there with their own apartment. And then as they need additional assistance, they can choose from a menu of services. These menu of services can be someone to take your blood pressure daily and um, help you with mobility, or to give you your pills and make sure you take it. And when you're in that situation where you need assistance, but I'm going to help you with a medical is a medical thing, but your rent isn't. But as you progress into, uh, it's often called assisted care and more fully assisted care, because you can't do those things for yourself then not only is the additional cost of that, most of them give you a flat, here's your monthly cost that includes these services, because the entire amount is considered a medical expense. Then you can no longer function on your own in the entire amount of the care, including what would be equivalent to rent, becomes a medical expense. And I've seen this overlooked many times with people who say, wow, we're spending a lot. And I, and I tell my clients when they're facing this situation, you don't have a tax problem anymore because your medical expense exceeds your adjusted gross income, so you don't have an income tax problem anymore. Let's say, let's find the money to pay for the expense. Yes. Yes. Very careful about the way you use the term assisted care, because in some places, assisted care is at middle level Yes. And it's not fully deductible until you reach the final nurse. There, there is no one word. Right. The words are not consistent from place to place to place. To place. Right, right. So, so that's why you have to, be, to look at be careful well, what, about the labels. Yes, that's all. yes. The labels is a problem because they, they mean one thing to American Baptist terms and they mean something else to uh, the forum and some of the other places that we have. So you have to look at your specific situation and say, what's going on here? And I'm not talking about skilled nursing. You know, I'm talking about where you're getting assistance. Skilled nursing environment, obviously, is fully constructed. But this is that intermediate category before you go into skilled nursing. Yes. Claudia, what, in your opinion, is the ideal age to buy long-term care insurance? Uh, and what is the oldest age that, in your opinion, uh, where you know, it would be reasonable to buy long-term care insurance? I, I'm not a financial advisor, so I can't give you feedback on that. I can, can suggest to you that I am seeing, and, and we are going to be a generation over the next 10 years where the people who did buy long-term care insurance are going to have it tested, aren't we? I remember when I bought my long-term care insurance, I was looking at getting it early enough because I was promised the premium would stay the same. Well, that, that kind of went down the wind too, didn't it? Yeah. In terms of it. And as more people start using it, those premiums have got to go up higher and higher. So, so there'll be more and more of a trade-off as people start using the long-term care. Um, I can tell you that when we started into the care for my mother and, and going through this process, what, uh, and for my clients who are using the long-term care insurance, it, it seems to me that some people are very fortunate and they have a quick illness and they pass and they say, gee, I wish I hadn't spent that money. Yes. Okay. Um, and I've seen other people where they have months and months and months and a couple of years of using their long-term care. 
So I, I think we're going to learn a lot about what long-term care categories are helpful and the benefits and not of having it. Um, I think some of the people that thought, oh, I'll just um, transfer my money to my kids five years in advance and they not have anything are wishing they hadn't done that at this point. You know, it's, it's a scary area. So I'm sorry I can't be specific and answer your question. But that's, that's something that when you check out the different facilities in the area, understanding how they deal with the long-term care insurance and reimbursement is real important. I think it's going to be a tough area. Got a microphone here? Yeah, regarding the uh, qualified long-term care expenses, the uh, criteria for deductibility include n uh, not being able to cope with the two of the activities of daily living. And I believe that there's an additional criterion that uh, there'd be a doctor's prescription yes. for care. Yes, do a doctor's diagnosis of what makes the person incapacitated that will lead, lead to their death. Yeah. It, so you have both of those pieces. Uh, I'm wondering how critical it is to actually have that. To get the doctor's diagnosis? Yeah. Yeah, I talked to a client yesterday who's refusing to, to be diagnosed. I mean, really, you know, you know, because he doesn't want to know. And um, that's a real tough thing for the family in terms of how they're going to go forward with it because they're not cooperating with the doctor. So it's important to document it, to have the doctor's yes. uh, prescription. And, and especially when I, when I amend a return for someone who had overlooked it as a deduction, I want that doctor's letter. Okay? Because that's going to be, here's the criteria, I've met it, here's how much it's paid. Okay? So, so the, you do have the two pieces. Yeah. In setting up a health care savings account in SSA. HSA, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was over 65 receiving Medicare in an HMO. Normally speaking, if you don't have a high deductible claim, you still could have cost outside of the HMO. Uh, so forget the agent, yes or no. Okay, so, so health savings accounts, I think are fantastic. I mean, my son's got his to be huge because I started his the very first year. He was still in college. You know? um, because to me, it's like a huge IRA he can use for medical expenses. But you can no longer contribute to those when you hit 65. And in fact, the year that you hit 65 and become Medicare qualified, you have to prorate that year in terms of what you can put in. So in terms of, of, well, now that I have this huge account, is your question, what can I spend the money on? You can spend the money out of that account to pay for your medical insurance, including your supplement plans with, um, with sup to supplement your Medicare, so there's no, but not to reimburse your Medicare. There's no exclusions that will allow over 65 to There's have no, an age set up a HSA. No, no. You, you put as much as you can in there up to 65, but once you hit 65, you can't put any more money in. Because it would be like double dipping. Well, you know, I, I told people all along, put it in this week, next week take it out. I mean, like for, for dental issues, for example. And I've had young people say, I'll never need that money. And I said, great, because look how much money you'll have. And it'll be tax sheltered because it can grow tax deferred you can invest it in anything you want to depending on who your trustee is on it but um so so to me they're great plans and especially when i run into someone who has retired early or didn't want to retire but was early dismissed from their company okay for that gap between 65 and 55 if you can have an hsa you've got two years of plowing that money aside so that you can build up a hunk of money that can be used for medical expenses. And like I said, you can use the money to pay for the insurance. They tell people, you put the money in now, use it next week to pay your deductible if you have to. Because yeah, HSAs, uh, they, they did not catch on as quickly as the government had thought they would, but they're still worth pursuing. Yeah. Yes. Do you have somewhere you recommend where <laughs> an HSA can be grown you know, and it, invested? You, it used to be that there's only a few places in the country that would even take them. And I would suggest trying the major brokerages and asking them now because some of them have taken these on. Actually, I'm not finding anywhere not finding that anywhere? will allow you well, to actually grow the money. In, grow the money in stocks? Wow. In anything. Because I know I have people that are, are doing that. I will have to ask them where they're putting it. Um, yeah. 
because the first place that had it was at HSA Bank, and um, then Pac Bell Credit Union, I know in this area takes them. So there are credit unions that do it. Wells Fargo Bank, I think, does it. You gotta watch and say, what are you gonna charge me for the privilege of having this with you? Because, because they do, they take fees. And you can say, wait a second, you're paying me 0.1% interest and you're charging me a fee of $35 a year? What's wrong with the picture? No. We have uh, Optum Bank. O-P-T-I-U-M. No, O-P-T-U-M Bank. O-P-T-U-M. And uh, uh -huh. I looked into it and Fidelity has them. I thought I'd seen Fidelity, yeah. And you can Google them and there's like five big companies that do right them. but i don't i don't have any experience like doing them you know outside of my company but yeah uh, i presume I, it seems like you can if you had it as a company you can move it to one of these other right you can do a trustee to trustee transfer on it um what that reminded me of is there's a wonderful website called it's probably hsa.com but it it provides answers to a lot of questions and it lists names of companies that will hold the money for you uh, if I had my little click it, click it from my screen at work, I'd be able to tell you. But there, there are good resources on the internet that describe places that are available to hold your money. Um, you may be planning to talk about this, but uh, child college. Uh, uh, the 529 uh, plan? 529, yeah, like for uh, my grandchildren. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I currently have a 529 plan for myself that I dole out. Now, the, the bad thing about me having my own 529 plan, because who knows, I may choose to go back to college someday. Or I may choose to give it to the grandchild who needs it. The downside of having my own 529 plan that I use the way I've been using mine is that it's included as part of my estate. What most people do is they set up a 529 for each child. And the account is gifted, and it's the child's account. So I think they're beautiful. I have a number of clients who have the resources that they can set up this 529 plan when the child is born. And by the time the child's 10 years old, they're saying, oh my goodness, look how much money that thing is worth, that I should stop putting money in it because it's going to be worth too much. Well, that, that's like an embarrassment of riches, I guess. It's a good news thing. Yes. Can it? Can HSA distributions be used to cover long-term care payments? You know, I think that's worth checking about. I can't tell you yes or no, but off the top of my head, the reason I would think that it's worth checking is that long-term care premiums, to the extent, the maximums that are put in the rules, are considered a medical expense. And since regular insurance premiums are considered an allowable HSA expense, I would think that the logic would follow that it would be, but taxes are not logical sometimes. So. But I would, I would guess it would be. When you use the microphone, yes, put, put, the, put the mic right next to the mouth. Okay. Everybody. I see you right there with your microphone. Yep, go ahead. Uh, what's, what's the advantage of uh, HSA over an IRA? Um, the difference between an HSA and an IRA is that an HSA is not age specific in terms of when you can use it. If I put in my 7,500 for a family right now, I can use it next week and draw out of it to pay for current medical expenses. It essentially makes, to the extent that the money's in there, it makes the medical expense a pre-tax deduction. You get a deduction just like you do with an IRA when the money goes in, if you qualify to do it. But so, so I guess you I, don't have to wait till you're 59 and a half to right. use it. So I guess I have a follow-up question. If you are qualifying age. Yes, under 65. Is it the same thing, basically? No, because I can't take money out of my IRA to pay for medical expenses. Well, you can take your money out of your IRA and pay for anything. Yeah, and you can, and it's taxable to you. But if I pay for medical expenses out of my HSA, I don't pay taxes on the money as it comes out. Okay. okay? So it's, it's a pre-tax way of paying for the medical expenses. Um, you have to be the right age to do it. And for people who were early adopters of this, they've got a nice, you have your healthiest years, then you have your years where you've got to take care of your kids and the healthy visits might suck up some of the money. Dental is the number one thing I see people using it for right now because a lot of people don't have good dental coverage. I have clients who they have told me, I've never taken any money out of my HSA. And I say, why? They say, oh, because someday I know I will 
and for right now it's just accumulating and it's a tax deferred account and I can afford to pay for my medical because I'm still employed. Okay, so that's, that's a different thought on a way of, of using it. So the key thing with the long-term care expenses is to check and see if the person qualifies because it's medical. Um, yeah, all medical care. And um, when you have someone you're caring for, you can check and see if they qualify as a dependent. There's also a category, and I'm not going to say they have to be a dependent to qualify for this because there's a special exception when it comes to deductible medical expenses. For example, if I had an adult child who was in an accident and they needed medical money to pay for their medical expenses, there are two things that would help that would qualify. I can still deduct their medical expenses because absence the fact that they had been employed for six to nine months beforehand, their income so high, uh, they would have been a qualifying person. And second, it's not a gift. If I give the money to them, it's a gift. If I write the check to the uh, hospital or the doctors, it's not considered a gift for the purposes of the annual $15,000 exclusion. So if you run into a situation where you are having to help people for medical, if you pay the medical bills directly to the care providers, you avoid any issue with making taxable gifts and more. Okay, let's move on to the next category. Tax Cuts and Jobs Act limits annual itemized deductions for all no, non-business state and local taxes. And that was the 10,000. Now this applies from the year 2018 to 2025. Now, I mentioned the 2025 because most of the provision in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, because they were such a giveaway, it was not a balanced provision. It uh, extended the deficit amazingly. They have to put a, a, a sunset with it. And so these new rules, this great, amazing tax bill, has new rules that self-destruct at the end of 2025. So how many of you have tracked what was going on in terms of the states that uh, have problems with their constituents being severely limited by the $10,000? So for example, litigation in New York, New Jersey, Texas is one of the top five states. And we say, well, Texas doesn't have an income tax, but they have amazing property taxes. So, so it wasn't just the income tax states, but recently New York and New Jersey got the answer that all of us knew they would get when they tried to fight back and say, can the federal government do this to us? The answer is, of course the federal government can do this to us because they passed a law giving themselves the ability to do it to you. Now, California didn't get involved in that lawsuit. California tried to say, well, let's see what else we can do. And they chose not to, to follow along with it. Um, but when it comes to the state and local taxes, let's think through some of the issues that that created with the, what we call SALT workarounds. Let's say I'm gonna put three of them up here. The SALT workarounds. Some people have either a vacation home or a home office. When you have a vacation home or a home office, and it's the same house that you live in or, or your second home that you also live in occasionally, then you allocate a piece of the property taxes on that home off from, from your primary deduction as a, as a personal deduction over to your business deduction for home office. Make sense? And if it's a vacation home, I'm getting positive rents coming in, and I'm told I have to offset those rents in a sequence order that says 100% first followed by interest and taxes for that percentage and take them over there. Well, the question comes up, if I'm paying $115,000 I mean, $15, a year for the property taxes on my home, and I'm able to put $3,000 over here on my vacation home, and $1,000 and $1, over here for my home office, and then I only have $11,000 left on Schedule A, then I'm not losing that much, right? Because I can take up to ten. Good attempt. That's what I would call it when you kick on the goal and it doesn't get there. Because the way the government interpreted this was that 
no, Claudia, you start with the ceiling at, at 10. It's the maximum. And you can put your $3,000 over on this schedule E for your vacation home, and you can put your $1,000 over here for your home office, but that means you've only got $6,000 less that you can put on Schedule A. Not what we wanted to hear, right? This guidance showed up toward the beginning of the filing season in this PTMA, Program Manager's Tax, uh, tax Advisory, Advisory, that's what a PTMA is. And it talks about this interplay between this 10,000 limitation and these, these other places you move the money. So those of us thought starting filing season, great, I'll just make sure I allocate as much as I can in my vacation home, then it'll reduce the amount that I don't get to deduct over on Schedule A, found out that wasn't the case. So um, someone, someone at the break, a gentleman uh, talked to me at the break, and we were talking about these issues of what kind of guidance that we had in terms of, of this kind of nuances in the law. And the guidance was, was issued out and what level of authority it has. Now let me give you a really quick primer on this. Level of authority. What are the laws? Congress passes the laws. That's what we have to follow. There are interpretations of the laws. Regulations interpret the law. We've got to follow the regulations. Then we start going down the, the, the list of other kinds of guidance issued by IRS. One of them is a revenue ruling. A revenue ruling is issued by IRS, and it, it is considered a guidance that we should follow, but it binds IRS. So if the IRS issues a revenue ruling, they have to follow it. But if I don't think it correctly has the spirit of the law, I can fight that and say, here's how we interpret it. So it's not considered a, a big G guidance for authority. And then we go on down the list of well, what other kind of things does IRS give to us that could follow? Well, this PTMA, this guidance about how you should allocate that 10,000, that's a program manager's, that's an internal guidance to their staff of how that's how they think that it should be done and that the people that work for IRS should follow it. If I don't believe that's the case, do I have to prepare tax returns that way? No. Okay. Can I prepare tax returns doing what I like in the first place? Where I put 3,000 over here, uh, offsetting the, the vacation home and 1,000 over there from the home office? I can, but if it's challenged by IRS, I know that they are directed to make it go the other direction. So you introduce that risk. You aren't entirely wrong in your reasoning, but you introduce a risk. Then even further down on this is what IRS did a whole lot of last year. And they're called FAQs, Frequently Asked Questions, and they post them on the internet. And if they change their mind after posting one, they simply take it down. This is real, okay? So this last filing season, when we were all trying to figure out, well, how does this stuff work? On, on April 11th, IRS posted 42 new FAQs about qualified business deductions. On April 11th, as I commented at NYU, how many of the audience, including IRS in the room, really believed that the people preparing their tax returns stopped what they were doing when IRS posted something on the internet on April 11th so they could integrate all those changes into the tax returns. Didn't happen. Okay. Most of us found out later when we finally got to read uh, what was going on through that period. So we have a, a problem this last year on the returns. That's why I was saying how much of this stuff is going to go through. And when it comes to specific issues, that, that category of taxes, and the deductibility and the 10,000 limit, that's specifically one that has problems. There's another thing that California did, I'm gonna ask if anyone did this besides me in the room, um, and it's called the California College Access Credit. Anybody else here use the college, California, California College Access Credit? Oh my goodness, okay. 
Okay, so what this is, and it still exists, is that California has a unique way of raising funds for their scholarships for the state colleges. And what they do is allow people to say, can I please, please give you money? And, and if I give them money and they give me a little certificate saying, yes, Claudia, you may give us, and I'll give you an example, $10,000, then we will give you a certificate that says you can take a credit against your California taxes for $5,000. What a deal. I give them 10. They say, here, we'll give you back five. And then on my federal return, well, the California Access State Credit, uh, State Charity, okay, I can take a $10,000 deduction on my federal return for that 10,000 I gave the California Colleges system. <laughs> Your adult children? What do you mean, they're still going to college? Oh. I don't know what the, we, I can't tell them what to do with the money because they're the charity. Okay. So I have no control of that. No, no, there's no deductions when you give anything to, to your kids. But what I just described to you is real, okay, and California isn't the only state that does this. Oregon has a, a state that has a charity that Oregon calls it the Oregon Cultural Fund. And if you make a donation to one of the, the entities listed as Oregon Cultural Entity, you give them $500, and they let you take $500, $250 as a credit on your state return. And you've got a $500 deduction on your federal. So it, it's a unique system, and a lot of states were doing it. And the federal government finds out about it because we put this $10,000 cap. And they say, wait a second, you can't get around this $10,000 cap by calling the money you gave a charitable contribution. And so what they did was effective last August 27th, they said, that's it. Can't do it anymore unless, and this is what got me, they said, unless the amount that you take for your credit is no more than 15% of the total. So apparently that rule that says, I can't take a deduction for something that charity that really gives me a personal benefit, okay, uh, has some limits. And I can get a personal benefit as long as it isn't more than 15%. So a lot of states were fighting this one, but this is still one of the issues that was hit and the guidance came out, came out definitively about the treatment of this particular credit. Other things that come out on this, so what can you do about it when these things happen? Okay. Did any of you work with change that? You owned a plant, you If you have a piece of land that your parents on, it's non-productive, right? Non-productive. There's an election you can make on non-productive real estate to take the property taxes you have and capitalize them where you add them to the basis in the property. If you're not getting to deduct them anyway, then on an annual basis, make this election to say, I, I'm not deducting them this year, but I want to add them to the basis, the cost of my property, so that when I sell the property, I, I don't pay taxes on as large a gain because I've accumulated those property taxes. And that's been in the law for years and years and years. A lot of people have not really used it because they were taking the deduction. It was more, you know, bird in the hand right now kind of stuff. I'd rather have a deduction. But it exists, and it's one of the things that you can use to help mitigate the effect of this limitation. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, on RevRoll 2019-11, if you're going to make it so that I can't deduct all of my property taxes and all of my income taxes, then what happens if I get a state tax refund? Okay. Is the state tax refund taxable? You think about it. The rationale that we've given people before this law change is that if you got a state tax refund, you took the full amount that was withheld or paid in as a deduction 
So if it comes back to you, you have to pay taxes on it now. If the maximum that I have in that box is 10,000, but it's made up of the property taxes, the DMV taxes, the income taxes I have, and if that total is well in excess of 10,000, then I didn't get the benefit of some of it. And so which of those things didn't, didn't I get a benefit of? So which comes first in that stacking order of what goes into the 10,000? And none of that's discussed at all. So the issue then comes down to, well, how do I know if I got a tax benefit? And in this uh, revenue ruling that came out, the, the bottom line way to visualize this is, since I only deducted 10,000, if I pull out income taxes completely out of there, would I still have topped 10,000? If the answer is, yeah, because your property taxes alone were more than that, then none of that's taxable. But it goes another step forward and says, well, okay, the excess over 10,000 didn't get you anything either. So if you got a state tax refund for $1,000, and you subtract the 1,000 from the total before you have the limitation, and it makes no difference at all in your tax, then you didn't get a tax benefit. So this year, watch that when you prepare your returns to see how the software is calculating it. One of the biggest problems with TurboTax that I'd seen over many, many years, it's, it's one of those little weaknesses in it, um, it has to do when you roll information over from one year to the next, and a lot of people weren't consistently rolling it over and letting it retain attributes from the previous year. Some people were just buying it and starting it fresh again. And they lose that ability to calculate the tax benefit rule when you do that. So visualize it, watch it, check it. In the back, there was a question. Yes, actually, two. One is, uh, is if you're forced into taking a standardized deduction because of this $10,000 rule, can you still find a way to uh, add to the basis of your home? So that's number one. And number two, how do you document the fact that you've done this so that you can... Uh, Remember it later? Rest. Yeah. Okay, so the election that I was mentioning a moment ago about the electing to capitalize the property taxes. An election, when you put it on a tax return, is done with a statement that goes with the return. And the statement with the return goes in and says, this is the particular property, this is the amount, and I'm making the election to capitalize taxes on non-productive real estate. The real question comes down to, is my home that I'm living in non-productive real estate? And I believe the, the tipping point on that is going to say the house you're living in is not considered non-productive real estate because you are using it, and that's what it's being used for. It's not making any money, but it's, I, I don't think it's going to qualify for non-productive amount. Let's move on to the issue about residence interest and make sure that we understand what, what's still left. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act limited the home mortgage interest deduction for tax years through, again, 2025, and it was effective for the year 18. It set a limit of $750,000 for any acquisition debt incurred after December 15. It makes no sense to me why these people that worked on this bill didn't try to make it December 31. And wouldn't that have made sense so that nobody was caught there between the 15th and the 31st of the year um, not knowing? So the deduction of interest on home equity debt is eliminated because that you can't deduct it is for that time period through the 2025 unless it's further cut off. So temporary pieces of it. So what does that mean if you had a loan on your home in excess of 750000 at the time. Mm -hmm. Well, pre-2018 loans up to $1 million were grandfathered and are not subject to this $750,000 cap. 
refinance without adding to debt are allowed. So, and I'm going to read the last one and then I'm going to go back and say, here's what I didn't say and here's what the definition is that, that qualifies here. Interest remains deductible on second homes but subject to the overall 1 million of the 750. In other words, if I have a second home and my mortgage, and I bought them in the last year, if my mortgage on one of them is 500,000 and the mortgage on the other is 300,000, then my ceiling is 750. So I can take all of one of them, for example, all of the 500,000, and I can take 250 of the 300,000 to hit to a maximum of 750. Now that loan that was grandfathered, that loan on the existing lo loan on your home that was grandfathered when this new law came in, let's make sure we understand what was grandfathered and understand how the, the um, rules for equity indebtedness work. So the rules prior to this change where it brought it back, go back to the year 1987. In 1987, the government says, boy, this is our big, biggest expenditure, is subsidizing people's interest they pay on their home. Which sounds like an odd way of describing your itemized deductions. But if you think of people that don't have homes, they don't get to deduct it. And those of you that do have homes do. So the government is subsidizing you for getting to take that deduction. That's why state taxes and mortgage interest rates were the biggest things that were hit off of Schedule A. So the rules that came into effect then talked about the acquisition debt on my house. Acquisition debt is the debt that I put on the house when I first bought it. When I bought this house, I, it may have been worth $500,000 I paid for it, but I put a loan of $300,000 on it. That is acquisition debt. And every time I make a payment on that debt, acquisition debt gets lower because a little debt goes to principal. So acquisition debt is constantly going down and is getting smaller. If I refinance the house and I simply replace the debt that's on it at the time that I refinance it, I still have acquisition debt that's the same as my new debt, my refi debt. But if when I refinance the house, I pull out $100,000 because I want to put money in a child's 529 plan. <laughs> and I think that's a good use of those funds. Then that $100,000 that I pulled out is not acquisition debt. What is it? I only have one loan on the house, one big loan. But the category of how the debt that I have in that loan is broken into pieces. And one of them is, this part of it is acquisition debt, but that extra 100000 I pulled out, what's the character of that? It's equity debt. So you can get equity debt by getting a HELOC, a, a, a home equity line of credit on your home, or you can refinance it and get take the, the portion of the funds that are in excess of the acquisition debt and use it for anything you want to. When I do that, I have tainted that loan such that when I report the annual interest deduction on it, I have to break it into two pieces. And acquisition debt gets deducted on Schedule A. What did I do with the rest of it? It depends on what you did with it. If I really did put it in my grandkids' accounts, I made gifts to them with it. And that's a personal expense, and none of it is deductible. If I took that $100,000 extra, and I put on, a, in this area, I was going to say a new bathroom and dining area, but around here you couldn't get a bathroom and a dining area for $100,000, could you? Mm -hmm. So if, if I used it to improve the house, and all of it was used to improve the house, then that entire $100,000 is acquisition debt, Acquisition, improvement, reconstruction, it's allowable. And so it would be fully deductible as qualified residence interest. So you trace the funds. It's called the tracing rule. It's what did you do with them? 
there's another requirement for a primary residence to be deductible, the interest to be deductible on it, you have to um, have it secured by. Secured by means that when you got that loan, they took the home as security. It's a mortgage on the home that you're living in. And that's an important element of this. Because if you borrow money and you use it to fix up your home and you do it on your margin debt and your margin debt is not secured by your home, then the deductibility of that margin debt is not qualified residence interest. And it's not margin debt to hold your investments either, is it? I mean, you could try to weave a good story about it, but a personal residence is not considered something you invest in for profit. So it would make the margin interest that you paid not deductible because of what you used it for, and it would be not deductible as residence interest because it wasn't secured by. So that's, that's a quick, quick and dirty look at this, but it caused a lot of confusion um, over the last year on these things. Um, so IRS did try to provide guidance and tell you that despite these newly enacted restrictions on home mortgages, you can often still deduct interest on a home equity loan regardless of how the loan is labeled, but it must be secured by the taxpayer's main or second home not exceed the cost of the home, be used by, build, or substantially improve that home, and be within the qualifying mortgage amount limitations. I can tell you IRS has had a lot of um, problems with trying to enforce these rules. So what do they do? They do correspondence audits. And when they do the correspondence audits, they said, show me what you did with the money. And I can tell you, if you've had a house in this valley for the last 30 years, it's probably tough for you to find the papers from refinances that you've done over that 30 years and to show them what you did with it. So you end up with a lot of problems with trying to prove how you did things and the improvements on the house. That's tough too. And I got to tell you right now, Franchise Tax Board, you sell a, a pricey home in this valley right now. My goodness, I have two cases in appeals to Franchise Tax Board, which will probably end up taking five years to get resolved because my client did not keep the canceled checks from the improvements made on her home during the year. I'm guilty, okay, okay. I mean, but, but that's the level of request that the Franchise Tax Board goes for when, when you sell a house. They want to say, show us how you came with the improvements. So I got a couple of questions and there's one over there and there's one here, so. Um, Right, right back to you. Okay. Okay. So I will take your question and then I'll repeat it and then I'll go to his. So hang on just a second. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But you've got to have something to establish that yes, you spent the money for it. And it's not just looking at an electronic image. It's, well, well, you gave that to John Smith. What did they do? Where's your receipt to show that they're related? It, it has been the most horrendous thing for me to deal with franchise tax board on these kind of things. Yes. So how about when you pay down your loan? When you Where, pay down your loan, you no longer have qualified residence interest. Okay, so you don't have to allocate, allocate it between qualified the, residents. The way, the way the regulations work is you go from the top down. Okay. If I put something on there, for, for example, if my qualified debt on it was 300000 but the loan is four, yep. and that 400000 is is equity debt that's not mm -hmm. deductible anywhere, mm -hmm. the presumption is that as I pay it down, I'm paying down that equity debt that's not deductible. Well, that's good. And then when I get down to the acquisition debt, then I start chipping away at it. Yes? So, probably a related question, I guess, going back to your example of somebody has a $500,000 mortgage on a first home and three hundred dollars on a second home. Yeah. And so limited to $750,000. But the principal down balance is declining every year. That's right. So how is that proration? I mean, the loans that okay. have different interest rates. I mean, this could get complicated. Well, well, two things on that remark. I mentioned we've got two loans. 
Well, you don't have to, to take the one on the house you're living in and at, that's you're paying three and a half on and the other you're paying four and a half. I'd go for the highest interest rate first in terms of using up my 750000 And the second part of it is wouldn't your ratio change annually? And the answer is yes, because you've got a declining um, amount that you're working with for the loan and you may have a static amount at the bottom for the denominator. So it changes every year. And you know what? And a lot of people used to say, well, how's IRS going to know? How are they going to know I've got this issue? Well, one thing, they added to the tax form on the Schedule A a little checkbox within the last year or so. And that little checkbox says, is any of the interest being paid on a loan that was not used to acquire your personal residence? Yeah. So the way tax rules work is you are making a sworn statement when you submit your tax return. If you read the part right underneath, it's tiny print, but it's underneath where you sign. This is true, correct, and complete to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. That's what you're swearing to. So you don't check one of the boxes. You falsify it, a piece of information. It, it counts against you. Yeah. So, so you have that. And then the form 1098, which is the form that comes to you saying, here's the mortgage interest you paid. The form 1098 over the last few years has, has added a box that says specifically on it, what year did this loan originate? And the best example of this I can give you uh, of what makes sense and, and how does anyone know? I had a gentleman come in and he was a little put off because his wife made him come to see me. Um, and I said, so what's the issue? And he says, well, my wife thinks that we're going to owe a lot of taxes because we just sold our home here in Cupertino. And I said, well, congratulations. Did you bring your tax return with you? He says, he says, because she thinks we're going to owe some taxes on the sale of it. And I told her we're not going to. And I said, well, did you bring last year's return with you? And he did. So I turned to the Schedule A and I looked at it. And he says, you know, we've held that house for 40 years. And I said, wow, you must have a horrendous gain. And he goes, well, he says, we didn't get hardly any money out of it. And I says, well, it looks like you've got a fairly hefty mortgage on it, but your property taxes, with that 40 years of ownership, your property taxes are, are about $600 a year. You did pretty good with those. And he says, yeah. And he says, and I didn't get much money out of it. And what I got out of it, I immediately paid cash, 200000 for a little house in Arizona. I said, well, good for you, because they can't afford to live here any longer. Okay. I didn't say that. Okay. But I says, here, here's an issue. When I look at your tax return, I'm wondering, how much major improvement did you in that, do in that house in the last year or so? He goes, none. We didn't have to. Oh. So how can I see a deduction for close to $40,000 a year in interest? When he hadn't made any improvements in the house, he'd lived there 40 years. So what's that telling me? I says, you know, I'm, I'm just guessing, but I bet over the last, you know, 20, 30 years, you pulled a little equity out of that house. And he goes, yeah, why wouldn't I? He says, the money was cheap. He says, I could take the money out and take care of our kids. And I said, well, that's where the problem's going to be. He says, what do you mean? And I said, because your basis is way down here at what you paid for the house and the improvements you put into it. It's not the value of the loan. And what you get to pay taxes on is the difference between your basis and what you sold it for less the costs. And I said, so it looks to me like, well, you get your 500000 exclusion, but it looks to me like you have over a million dollars of gain in this house. And he goes, but I didn't get that kind of cash out of it. And I says, yeah, yeah. And you spent what you got because you bought the other house. Well, th this thing about buying another house, that's been gone since 1997. You can't defer the gain by buying another house. So, so that, that part's gone. And the other part of it is, when you pulled the money out of the house, you know, those refinances, did you ever pay tax on any of that money? Well, no, it's not taxable. And I says, until now. Because you just got rid of the house and you closed off this game. And so you had the benefit of that money all those years, and now the government wants their piece of the game that, that you generated when you sold the house. He didn't like the answer. But that's what you're looking at. That's what you're looking at. So, so the IRS has, has made an attempt to try to capture some of this information by making sure that the lenders put specifically the date that, that mortgage started. 
and that's on the loans now. And they've asked them this next year to indicate whether it was an equity loan or whether it was an acquisition. The problem is the lenders have a real strong lobbying group. And when they see additional regulations specific to things like that, they're thinking, how much effort are they going to put on us about this? We don't want to be on the hook for providing that information. So they fight back about it. So I don't think they're going to get that one on. But the other one they did. Yes. From a cost basis tracking standpoint, mm -hmm. considering that probably many of us have had multiple homes over yeah. many decades, fourth home uh, back years ago, if I remember right, the the when it was sold, there was a, a form that was submitted that was, showing, yeah. uh, that was showing what the cost basis was and what improvements were made. Um, I would assume that if that can still be found, that would be an adjustment, adjustment to basis. Um, right. The other aspect uh, from improvement standpoint would be a lot of things are not just written in checks where you'd have a copy of the canceled check or the bank statement showing the copy of it. Uh, but rather charges to Visa, to card. MasterCard, mm -hmm. some of which could be pretty substantial. Yep. Um, and how does one track that, thinking that the philosophy, I think, that many of us have followed is that once you get past the uh, period of audit, yeah. uh, that, gee, you don't have to maintain all of the receipts. And uh, MasterCard, Visa, American Express receipts, yeah. are those suddenly things that, if they have major ex so documents. So here, here's the rule, and every rule has an exception. Your tax return closes after three years as to that particular year, assuming no fraud, California it's four, for that particular year, that any attribute that is used later, credits, capital losses that are carried over, always go back to when they began. And when it comes to basis in any asset, the basis in the asset can be challenged from the time that you acquired it till the three years after you sold it, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's why we're getting hit with these audits on residences in California that are from high pricey areas because it, you've been in that house for a long, long time, but you sell it and you sell it for $3 million, $5 million, um, $11 million then you've got to go back to that first day that you opened the escrow to buy that house. You need every escrow since then, and you need the credit card receipts or the, or the receipts from the, the vendor or whoever did the work on it, okay? and you need a dialogue and history. Um, and the thing that gets me the most on the two appeals that I have going right now, Franchise Tax Board is auditors. They are refusing to take anything that isn't that little piece of paper which is the cancel check or the credit card receipt linked to what it was done, okay? So, so. Because they don't have to. And until you get into an appeals forum where hazards of litigation are looked at, they won't look at common sense. My goodness, the people lived here. It was 3,000 feet when they started. It was 11,000 when it was sold. Here's pictures of the evolution of it. Those are evidences, but they're not receipts. So that, that's why so, the dilemma. So, so the proverbial... Uh, shoebox of receipts yeah. uh, has become a closet Boot of receipts, box. and <laughs> yeah. receipts will fade over years. Yep, I've uh, seen people who are scanning them in and keeping them in a, a, a smart, a, you know, flash drive or something. It's it's sad. Yeah. Like my oh, wait, we had two questions, but yeah. let's see. <clears throat> Let me, Don. So if you, uh, uh, first of all, your mortgage probably got sold and resold many times. Oh, yeah. And so, but yeah. it always goes back to the first time you open that mortgage, right? Well, the, you've got to, to justify the history of the mortgage. When another lender takes the mortgage. I didn't sell and resell a mortgage. They did. Yeah, right. But you go back and say, but here's the, it's the same mortgage. And here's when I bought, got the house in the first place, so I showed it. Okay. There's a difference between the mortgage being taken over by another lender and you refinancing the mortgage. Because refinancing can, can affect the terms and amount of it. We're simply Mr. Cooper taking over my mortgage, okay, from something that used to be a, a bank did not change the history of the mortgage itself. So the other question is regarding receipts. Uh, uh, from your credit card, you've got monthly statements and it lists yeah. uh, money you know, paid to certain people. 
does that count? It, it's supporting, it's supporting on it. Yeah. The 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 actual and, receipts are are faded or lost or long gone. Yeah, I mean, personally, I have a lot of problems with this because I know how I conduct my re receipts, and I I just felt like I hit a brick wall in dealing with the franchise tax form. Is it? There was another question. Yes. This is the same on the tax basis for the sale of a home. Say so, yes. So, is there a formula if you don't have receipts that you can use or? To say here's an estimate? Yes. No, I wish there were. Um, there's a Rob Lowe, maybe you guys remember, he's a famous uh, actor. Okay. He has a, what I would call a landmark case um, in California where he did a, a rebuilding of his home and he sold it. And he ended up winning a case with the um, Franchise Tax Board after many years of fighting because they said that he didn't keep the detailed receipts. And they use what's called the Cohen rule, which is um, if you can prove that something happened okay, and that it logically would have taken money to make that happen, then you can try to do an estimate. And I know for both of, both of the clients that I'm dealing with right now, on one of them we tried an estimate. Well, actually, she had amazing receipts, but California didn't like them because she didn't have canceled checks. So we're going to go into a, a, an appeals forum where I think someone with common sense is going to settle that one. The other one was a family who, 22 years, and they were not good record keepers. Okay. And in their case, we are introducing all kinds of other evidences to show that it existed, and we will negotiate and we will settle. I do not believe that they will get the current assessment for tax uh, that we're fighting is in excess of 380000 and if we can settle for half that, I'll consider it a win because they don't have the documents with the breadcrumbs, you know, the breadcrumbs that lead you to the conclusion. And we're doing our darndest to reconstruct and to get opinions as to what it would have cost for them to do what they did. But they're opinions, they're not receipts. Uh, your property tax assessor lists what they consider the current value of your house, even though it's twice what you paid for it. Uh, and even so, that is going to be way less than no. you could sell it for. Okay. Can well, you use that as a basis? Well, I, I, what I found interesting in, in one of the cases I'm representing on right now is that, that we have detailed handwritten notes as to what she paid the general contractor to build the house. And people tend to overbuild, I gotta tell you that. So her records come to 1.4 million for the construction. And because she didn't have canceled checks, Cancel check. And the FDB agents that I worked with them just shook their head and said, I'm sorry, I can't accept this. Okay. Anyway, it makes me crazy. But um, we'll, get, we'll get to someone who has common sense outside of that realm eventually. But they actually did go to the property tax assessors and said, okay, we're willing to acknowledge a house is sitting there that wasn't sitting there three years ago. Duh. Okay. So, so they used the property tax assessors' increase in value. And they said that's as much as... The property tax assessor increased the value of the home by nine hundred thousand. The property by nine hundred thousand dollars, even though she spent one point four million. Okay. Now maybe it goes other ways, other times, but that still wasn't enough because they're going through the difference between that, saying, "Well, then we're going to take his basis and not yours, and so you'll only have to pay taxes on this extra piece here." We didn't like that answer either. Yes. Last question, then we're going to move to the next concept. Yeah. Um, some practical advice for uh, some of the older people in this room. For record keeping? Not record keeping. Oh. You can evolve all these problems that have been talked about in the last five minutes by um, not selling your home before you pass. <laughs> let, me, let me finish. Date of not, death value. Not, yes. not selling your home before it passed. When you pass, it goes to fair market value. You can then... Uh, Whoever inherits it can sell it right afterwards. And pay no taxes. And pay no taxes. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, Marvin Starr, famous in the Bay Area because he was the one that, attorney that represented in the Starker decision, had, had a favorite saying, and he was an attorney in the Oakland area, um, and it was, die with a low basis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Heroes in the tax world, die with a low basis. Okay, let's see. It's not moving. Let's, let's, 
I don't think I accidentally turned it. It's on. There it is. Okay, this, this is continuing to summarize the issues on the house and how the proceeds are used on it. So moving on down the Schedule A, to, to wrap it up quickly, um, when it comes to charitable contributions on the Schedule A, um, Congress knew that they were going to be impacting charities all across this country because they thought that people just might stop giving as much because they weren't able to deduct it because they could take a standard deduction. So in their great wisdom, okay, Congress increased the amount that be given, you know, from 50 to I don't have too many people occasionally I'll find someone who gives away too much, where we are limited. But that's that's how this works. Um, so if you if you're wondering how much charitable contributions you can give before the end of the year, you, if it's cash, you can give up to 60 percent of your adjusted gross income and still be able to deduct it. Yes. Yes, if you're giving appreciated securities, it's 30% of your AGI. As long as you're giving it to a public charity, giving it to a private foundation, it drops to 20% of your AGI. No, it's based on fair market value. And you never give away a short-term position, okay? Because if you say, wow, this thing ran up so quickly, I'm going to get rid of it, um, don't give it away because if you do, you don't get to take the fair market value on a short-term position. You get to take your basis. So it's not going to help him out. Let's see. The last thing I'm going to mention is if you visualize Schedule A, miscellaneous deductions at the bottom of it, almost all of them are gone. Almost all of them are gone. Uh, portfolio management fees, employee business expenses, that whole category isn't there anymore on your federal return, but California still has it. So don't overlook the deduction for your California return for that. Now the next category and the last category we're going to talk about is what's called the 20% QBI, Qualified Business Income. Qualified Business Income Deduction. This is a new concept that came into the law as a way to... Uh, Let's see if I can remember some of the rhetoric that was spouted at the time that they were trying to get this into the legislation is to be a boon to small businesses and to help Main Street USA. And uh, by allowing people who were the business people to deduct, who were having to report the income from the business, to deduct 20% of the net business income. Okay? Wouldn't that be beautiful? If I have a small business and I make $80,000 net, then I have to pay my Social Security, Medicare on my eighty thousand. But and I bring the eighty thousand as income. But after I've done all of my other deductions, just before I get to taxable income, I can look at any other qualified business income in that return and take twenty percent of it as an adjustment, and not pay taxes on it. Beautiful, right? Um, for those people that applied to, but it didn't apply to the business of being an employee, so employees didn't get this, so they didn't see any benefit from it either. And the question became is, well, what about a business with a loss? Well, you're not going to get a deduction for a business with a loss, but even the more basic question was, what's a business? What's a business? So when it comes to this, any trader business except Specified service trader businesses. Um, specified service trader business. These are businesses that our Congress chose to handpick and say, you guys don't get the 20% deduction. Specified service of business includes accountants, includes attorneys. It includes people who sell financial products, but not people who sell real estate. Gee, which of those has the biggest, most organized lobby? Okay. So people who sell real estate qualify, but if you sell securities, you don't. Professional engineer uh, and architects, I think they fell into the category two for a specified service trader business. Does it medical? Yes. Now here's a question. Medical? Is a chiropractor considered medical? I mean, for years, they say, yes, we are. 
And then when it comes to this provision, well, maybe we don't want to be at this point, okay? Um, and if, if you're a chiropractor and you, you sell supplements and other kind of products in your business, <coughs> do you have one business or two? See, if one of them is going to be a specified service business, I want to have two, don't I? <coughs> so you run into those kind of issues. So 20% of the qualified business income gets this, this benefit. <coughs> but there was two other categories that were on this. You also get a 20% reduction. And one of them was REITs. The other one was publicly traded partnerships. Now, I'm not going to go into publicly traded partnerships because it's a miracle if you can find one that makes money. Okay? A positive income, taxable money is what I'm referring to. But an REIT, you can find REITs, and REITs had not been given the benefits of the qualified uh, stock in most cases because they were put into a subcategory that says, it says what you are distributing isn't necessarily earnings from your business. It's, it's the rental income, and you're getting the benefit that a lot of it's not taxable because of depreciation. But then the portion that was considered taxable wasn't considered qualified dividends. So the thought behind the REITs in this is it was to try to help benefit the REITs as an investment vehicle by giving them preferential treatment. So if you have REIT dividends that are not qualified dividends, but they're ordinary taxable, then they will qualify for this 20% reduction. Okay. There was a box on the 1099 DIV last year. If you missed it, don't miss it next year. <laughs> if you didn't understand why it was there or that there was another line that was added to the data input lines, this is why. Because to take that 20% flat of that category makes that a more tax incentive type of investment. So what's a qualified business? It's the net amount of qualified items of the income gain, deduction and loss from any qualified trader business, including income from partnerships, S-corps, sole proprietorships, and certain trusts. If the trust is maintaining a business, and most trusts aren't, but if it's got a rental in there, it might be. Then, then you can have a situation where the information is on the S-Corp return, the K-1, the uh, partnership K-1. And the person who's preparing that partnership or S-Corporation is making the determination as to the categories that this income is. Now, some of the other limitations that go along with this, um, has to do with how much income is on the taxpayer's return. So in that example where we were talking about accountants and attorneys and chiropractors and medical and these are not going to qualify, well, sometimes they do qualify. Well, what's the difference? The difference is how much income is on that tax return. If the tax return has income under $157,000, then it doesn't matter if the income came from an attorney, an architect, accountant. You're gonna get your 20%. If it's a joint return, it's twice that. 157 would be 300 and, yeah. So you can see where I'm going with it. You get twice that level. Then we aren't gonna worry about whether you're a specified service, trade, or business. You're gonna get your 20%. But as you approach your end, if you're in one of these professions and you're close to that, level, my goodness, look at it and see whether you should put money into a retirement account to get yourself under the threshold so that you get the 20% deduction. There's a lot of planning and games that will be paid with that. Uh, one of the other issues that comes into the same category is um, when is a piece of real estate a trader business? A piece of real estate, if you have a rental, is that rental a trader business? Well, some people say yes, some people say no, okay. and um, the parts that speak towards that suggest that as a rental, why are you in the business, of, why, why are you renting the property? Is it to make a profit? Are you conducting it in a business-like manner? Are you 
reporting your income, taking your deductions from it. So that, that has become a real tipping point, and a tipping point in terms of there's so many people that applied to it. We were so frustrated with IRS not a, giving us a definitive answer to this at the end of last year that in January of this year, they sent out a notice, notice 2019-7, that talked about a safe harbor for rental real estate enterprises. And the bottom line on that rental real estate enterprise is if you want to be a rental real estate enterprise, you have to be able to confirm that it's actively, that it's, so that a level of activity takes place all the time. And so in that ruling, they said, well, we'll give you an example of one that doesn't qualify this real estate. If you own a triple net lease, a triple net lease is I pay for it, I own the property, and I get a check every month, and I don't have to pay for real estate taxes, I don't have to pay for insurance, I don't have to pay for all of these other pieces because the person who's renting it from me pays for everything. And in that, there's saying there's no requirement that you actively participate at all, so that can't qualify for this 20% reduction. My clients who have triple net leases, they love the checks coming in monthly and they love the income it produces, but we don't get this 20% off. And then they said if there's any quasi-personal portion of it, even if you have a vacation home that brings in 20, 30,000 a year, your personal usage of it at all taints it and then we have everything else. Everything else is the person with 20 rentals or a partnership they've invested in that has a huge apartment complex. On that stream, all of us would look at it and say, well, that huge apartment complex has got to be a real estate enterprise. And that person that's got 10 properties, well, you would think that, that with that many properties and that much activity, that that would be a real estate enterprise. But then they set, step back and say, but you make this determination about your real estate enterprise on a property by property by property by property basis. You could have 10 little businesses. So what I'm getting to on this is it was an area last year where a lot of people just shook their head that were preparing tax returns. They didn't do the analysis with or for you on that. And I've seen a number of people who could have qualified to take a 20% adjustment and they didn't because they didn't know that they could or that they would qualify. So you got another shot coming up this next year. The, uh, the guidance that came out in this uh, revenue, it was a revenue ruling that was proposed, it became a revenue procedure and went final, it says keep the records to show your activity level. And it's not just your physical activity level, if you have a property manager, how much time did they spend? If you have a guy who comes through and does the, the lawn weekly, how much time are they spending? It's anybody that works on that property. Well, we had a plumbing problem, and this guy must have been there six times during the year. How much time each time that he was there? That's what it's going to be looking at in terms of giving you a safe harbor of saying, yeah, this is a business for me, and I want my 20%. So that one's one that I would put in the unanswered questions um, and ask, is year-end planning still worthwhile? Bunching deduction still works. Alternate years for itemizing versus standard deduction. When you look at that standard deduction, what I tell my clients when it comes to this bunching issue of moving things from one year to the other, when it comes to charitable contributions, go big or go home. Okay. Meaning if, if you normally contribute to a number of charities and you want to continue that, then make a large donation to a donor advised fund one year and then spread it out out of the fund for the next couple years. The charity gets to get the money that they usually get from you, but you get the benefit in a year by topping out that standard deduction at least once. So if you're RMD age, absolutely use your required minimum distributions for your qualified charitable, charitable donations. This is a beautiful thing to do. Unfortunately, when it is, um, when the returns are prepared, if you're using a return preparer, they have no clue that you did it because you have to tell them. There is no indication on the 1099-R that any of that money went to charity. It still reports the gross amount. And this category is so beautiful that um, 
some of the brokerages and uh, banks that hold your IRAs are now willing to give you a checkbook on your IRA. Now, the reason it doesn't matter to them when you take that money out or how much you take is because anything that comes out of that account is going to be shown as a distribution out. And they don't have to take responsibility for how you spent the money, but you do. So if you write the check to charity out of the IRA, if you're over 70 and a half, it can be a qualified charitable donation, but you have to reconcile it on your tax return when you file. Yes. Yes. Doesn't say anything. Yes. That's right. Yeah. The instructions, well, no, 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 that wouldn't do it because the instruction to the brokers is that they are not to account for any of that. So the gross amount and the net amount are exactly the same. What, what broker? Who issued it? Who issued it? I, I, hundred, I see hundreds of them. Not, not for that. Oh, taxable amount not determined. Okay, well, that's not, that's not because you did a QCD. That's just because they aren't taking responsibility for determining it. They can't, they don't do it. That's right, they will not do it. But that's not why that box was checked. So I couldn't, have, where, how did they change it? I don't know what, yes. Doesn't the QCD need to be taken before the RMD, any other RMD? Here's the way it's written. The first money coming out of that account is considered RMD, okay? So if, what you don't want to do is to go ahead and take your RMD and then at the end of the year start taking more money out to do QCDs. Because if you do, you've shot yourself in the foot. Okay? You haven't sheltered the RMD. So you want to write the checks out of the first money that comes out. But as, as he indicated a moment ago, brokerage will take no responsibility at all. It's all up to you. And your requirement is that you get a receipt from the charity thanking you and you have proof that they got the money. And I'm preparing an amended return for someone right now who didn't bother to mention or she got confused in terms of which of the contributions were our QCDs and she sent me the wrong information. So last week she sent me information. I says, so this 640 came out of your, she says, my credit card. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Here's the 2000 that was the QCD. So I said, we need a copy of the money coming out of the IRA so we can see it going out, and we need a copy of the receipt by the charity. And that's our verification so we can take these. So let me finish up because I thought I was supposed to stop right at uh, 12, and I see Minnie's hands going past that. Let me just put the rest of the pieces up here if I can get them up. The things you've done before, the loss harvesting makes sense. Roth conversions, there are no more do-overs. Be very careful. We saw someone recently who didn't realize that Roth do-overs don't exist anymore, and uh, they got stuck big time because you can't put the money back anymore like you used to um, on the next tax year. And the final piece of advice is consider relocating to a tax-friendly state. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Be sure to fill out your survey forms and hand them in, and. Uh...